You are listening to the Necropolis Podcast, which is brought to you by Jason from Goatcraft and Shelly from HateMeditations.com and Metal Lesion Magazine. Welcome to Necropolis. We are back in action with another tier list. Uh, this time we're doing metal adjacent music. Uh, so a lot of the albums that we chose and uh, soundtracks and all that, we believe there's... Uh, some kind of connection to metal, but maybe, you know, a different format, perhaps sharing a, a spirit or a vibe or, you know, some some element that metal, metal heads will be attracted to. Um, so we do have the wonderful Shelly from HateMeditations.com and Metal Legion Magazine. Thank you, Shelly. Hello. Yeah, I will say from the outset, because this is a much more diverse group of artists, the ranking will be slightly more arbitrary than usual. But as always, our decision is final and it is the official um, gospel version of the truth. And we won't accept any dissenting opinions on the matter. So, Well, OK. Uh, Shelly has spoken there. Um, so apologies if this list offends you today. I know a few of you guys in the comments section weren't really fond on some of the other tier lists we did. And uh, yeah, life sucks. And um, go back to Reddit. Um, Tyler, thank you for joining, Tyler. Thank you for having me. I eagerly await the opinions that we're going to have on uh, our tier list here. Uh, they've been really good on the past few ones. People telling us that uh, what we did was awful and that they disagree entirely with our uh, reviews of some of the bands. Good stuff. <laughs> I'm joking a little bit. We had a uh, lot of positive feedback, too, probably more than the negative feedback we had. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I definitely welcome all of those comments on YouTube, Spotify, all of that. It's very entertaining stuff. We seem to have a full spectrum of reactions from super positive to super negative and everything in between. And uh, there's one guy on Spotify, I think he's referring to me um, when I have a couple of beers, is that I tend to get a little nasally, I, I suppose. And he's, he's always writing the same comment over and over and over on Spotify. It's you know, I, I agree with the guy at the stuff he knows. So hopefully he's referring to me because I, I think he is. Uh, but uh, yeah, last night I did have a, a few uh, cox, cocktails, that is. And uh, so today's my birthday and a little hungover. Um, but yeah, we're, we're still going to plow through this uh, tier list today. Um, I apologize if I'm not as sharp as usual, which I don't believe I'm ever sharp, but the C sharp, minor that is. Uh um, but anyway, yeah, uh, yeah. So let's get into this booger of a tier list of metal adjacent music, right? So the first up, um, I chose the first five here, and Shelly chose the second five, and we have Raphael. Um, he might have been sleeping in or something. Maybe he was celebrating my birthday too, and um, he he may be joining us. But yeah, he chose some albums and soundtracks, and uh, as well as Tyler. Um, so I'm going to go through the first five that I chose. And then uh, Shelly will go through his, and we'll kind of chime in and rank them as we see fit. So first up is the band Awen. Awen is a, a neo-folk band, uh, kind of martial industrial too, um, from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I've played many shows with them. They're great people. I kind of chose uh, their album, The Hollow and the Stone, as like the probably the best record by them, at least my favorite. They did come out with like a remix version of uh some of the songs that are on this album and i i think those are phenomenal too um alwyn has a really great stage presence when you see them live it's is just musical enough um for neo folk and so neo folk isn't ever like super super you know sophisticated or anything like that but it's more about painting the specific aesthetic and they get into like you know ancient modes and of poetry and things of that nature it really paints this great atmosphere um so i i kind of view uh, a lot of metalheads are also in the neo folk um which is you know interesting it's like you know stripped down version of uh music i would say is more of like poetic uh aspects to it um and as such i do enjoy it a lot um the all one compared to some of the other releases on here especially that bruckner is coming up I wouldn't place it that high. Um, I do love them. They're great people and you know, very good, you know, content that's on this album. But I would put it above average. I wouldn't put it in like a, a timeless classic. 
And again, this will appeal to the uh, metalhead who likes uh, the more folky aspects of music. Um, they're a great band to check out. Definitely, uh, I'm just going to put them between an A and a B. Um, I think they succeed uh, a little bit further to put them, you know, above average. So I'll put them between an A and a B. How about you, Shelley? Yeah. So again, from the outset, I'll say that the grading will be slightly arbitrary because it's not as direct a comparison as some of the previous lists we've done but yeah revisiting this arwen album um it's really really fucking good actually um and the thing that i love about it is it bridges the kind of older definition of neo-folk and the slightly newer one the sort of post wardruna definition i suppose you could say and that it's kind of become um mixed up in this whole sort of Nordic folk revival with bands like Wardruna and Heilong getting very, very popular. But neo folk, uh, as it came from like the post-punk movement in the late 70s and early 80s with bands like Death in June and later Soul Invictus and things, very closely tied to early industrial um, and post-punk and, as you mentioned as well, elements of martial ambient. You could even sort of liken to bands like Lieback as well. Um, and through that, it's kind of like the ultimate um, post-modern genre in a way because it comes out of industrial uh post-war industrial civilizations um societies but it's a kind of an attempt to reconnect with a much older form of music and kind of craft um a sort of new kind of spiritualism uh very kind of connected with paganism but a very modern interpretation of it um but you also get um the artificiality of industrial and the very kind of mechanized rhythms and things blended with what we would consider to be really organic, uh, folky music, like connected to the earth, connected to nature, connected to older pre-Christian religions. And that's all here on this Arwen album. They sort of, for such a broad, unfocused genre, they managed to encapsulate it while still making a very distinct um, statement. And yeah it's it's dramatic it can be minimal it can be um sometimes a little bit silly but in a really good way in a sort of melodramatic uh sort of theater kind of way um but yeah on its own terms i think between an a and a b is um is a fair assessment it's really really fucking good um but i don't think it's been out long enough to have sort of decide whether it stood the test of time compared to some of the neo folk albums so i think that's a very fair ranking in my opinion all right, yeah, um, they're they're great people, and there there was a little bit of controversy around them, of course, um, with the uh, the Boyd Rice Association. They played a gig with Boyd Rice here, and uh, I guess Antifa or whatever was protesting that, and they continued on regardless. Um, and I think there is a live recording of that that they released as well. Um, Tyler, what are your thoughts on the Alwyn? So, uh. Last night, as I was listening through all of these albums uh, to prepare myself for today, was, that was the first time I had ever heard of the group. Um, but I did find it pretty enjoyable. Uh, of course, for me, being a uh, neophyte of sorts to Alwyn, uh, uh, the immediate comparison was to Death in June, who then uh, later on was a guest on one of the tracks. And I had two British men talking to me. Or Alwyn isn't British, are they? Are they from the U.S.? Yeah, they're, they're just really highbrow, sophisticated types of people that I can see how the average American can think they're, you know, a, a, a limey Anglo person. Go ahead. Yeah, they have a little bit of that accent somewhat in the vocals that they do, but I suppose it fits in with the theater, um, which I appreciate. It's never something that I've uh, really latched onto with neo folk, but I have a respect for people who will do what they feel is necessary for the spirit of their music, even if it looks goofy to the eyes of others. Um, I have always uh, found that charming. Um, the folk aspects of it, I thought, were really well done and makes me feel that it should be ranked higher than some other neo-folk albums I heard that lean a little bit more into the industrial or noise aspects of the genre. Um, so overall, I thought it was an enjoyable record. Uh, when it comes to neo folk, about the only group that I listen to consistently, if you could consider them entirely neo folk, is uh, Endura. But it was an enjoyable listen. I think that where it's ranking now is pretty good, in my opinion. 
Interesting. All right. Uh, thank you for your input there, Mr. Tyler. Um, seems like we kind of agree that they fall between an A and a B, at least with this album. I know they're working on new material. And Wes, uh, the guitarist, um, very, very uh, talented individual. He has a side project called uh, Minartis, um, solo uh, kind of black metal. And just really, you can tell there's a lot of folk influences in there. Um, so, yeah, I have nothing but good things to say about uh, Awen. Like I said, I played at least four or five shows with them. Um, throughout the years and you know had quite a few drinks with them and uh Aaron the vocalist um and his wife uh we went and saw uh Das Rheingold by Wagner uh earlier this year and had uh some drinks at English pub afterwards so uh great people um so yep next week we have the uh the goat craft or Sinia Pestis um not just where's he gonna put it where's he gonna put it not just to toot my horn, um, but people have confronted me saying that this is like the, the most, you know, representative type of metal adjacent neoclassical out there. Um, and this album in particular, I, I've had uh, people chime in on saying this is their favorite and there's like a metal spirit through it. Um, so it's kind of weird because I know today is my birthday. Um I, I turned 39 today. Um, so I'm getting up there. I'm getting old. And I wrote this album in 2015, I would like to say, 2014, 2015, around there. And I've really evolved as a musician since I like, did this album. Um, there are some aspects of this, uh, the material that I thought, you know, I was doing a good job but in hindsight. Um, especially compared to the music that I'm working on now, um, it's too diatonic. Um, there's, I, I know the specific keys I'm playing in, and yeah, I know I wrote it, of course, and I'm gonna know it inside and out. Um, but compared to like the the, I said on a different show, I'm working on like listy and omni tonality. It's essentially chromatic scales that are your backbone of the uh, the music and uh, doing a lot more with the motifs re-emerging and, you know, driving the mu music forward. This album doesn't really have much of that. It is kind of, and I, I did kind of have the back of my mind, it's like, well, my main audience is, you know, fucking metalheads. And so I did make it a little bit more digestible than it should have been. So, yeah, um, because I, I look back on this album and I don't derive any enjoyment from it, I, I will be placing it as enough. Come on now, don't be, don't be Mr. Serious. Humble. I'm so, so humble. I'm serious. I, I am so far beyond this fucking album now that I, I never want to see it again. Like even on this tier list, this pisses me off. So, oh, uh, Shelly and I are gonna have to bump this one up. <laughs> yeah, I bet, I bet the guys in Carcass think they're so far beyond Reek of Putrefaction now when they released it in '88. But I still get enjoyment from that album. Um, so I'll preface what i'm saying um by just noting that i have been familiar with goatcraft for much longer than i've known jason as a person and my opinion on goatcraft has nothing to do with what i think of jason as a person so i'm not just gonna blow smoke up his ass um because i respect him as a friend um i play piano nowhere near to the level that jason is capable of i'm also a huge metal fan and a fan of like the surrounding ambient and folk genres as we're discussing today so in many ways Goatcraft was like the perfect project for me and i should also say in terms of like classical music i'm often drawn to solo piano pieces the sonata form far more than i am sort of symphonies surely, surely not um, one song on this album holds up through like true scrutiny well like if you're going through like you know classical music lens i'm not i'm not gonna theory, hold it to I'm not going to hold it to the standards of a piano sonata, but I am going to say that if you look at it in terms of the Goatcraft like journey, like the debut all for naught, I really like the feral aspects to that, where it's you rarely see piano playing that aggressive, um, and something like the Blasphemer, which is much more like a broader, longer conceptual piece. Whereas this, I think, is is just it's much more expressive. And the thing I love about Goatcraft is it's clearly affiliated to metal. And there's a lot of keyboard music in metal, but you rarely see the virtuosity and the expressiveness of the keyboard used. You take, 
you know, a band that's really famous for using keyboards, like Summoning or someone, they use keyboards really, really well, or, or Graveland, but they're they're adding texture and they are using some melodic licks now and then, but they're really there as kind of adding to the furniture. Whereas, you know, Goatcraft puts the piano front and center, uses it as a very expressive instrument, every bit as expressive as the lead guitar, um, and uses it very aggressively as well. It makes the piano heavy, you know, it's like Rachmaninoff or something. It really pulls out like the feral kind of aspects of piano because it is you know essentially a percussive instrument as well and that, that's what i love about about goat craft even though you're probably too close to the material and you see the shortcomings because you know everyone is their own harshest critic but yeah for me it, it's a standout and i think it, it definitely belongs at least on the level with the arwen album in my opinion yeah the, so when I, when I look back on this album and you look at uh how the songs are constructed it's, it's a lot of metal like spirit there and knowledge um rather than classical music so essentially the there's a lot of songs that are based on like piano riffs if, if that makes sense and how the riffs move together is how i wish a lot of metal kind of moved together and that's how i approached it i approached it as a uh through a metal lens rather than an art music type of lens, if that makes sense. So, uh, like I said, I recorded this years and years and years ago. I'm so far beyond it now. Like the the new music I'm working on, I, I, I truly believe is art music. Um, so, Tyler, go ahead. So, I'll start out my uh, two cents on this album by saying this is my favorite Goatcraft album. Um, I like the entire discography that I've heard. Um, but this one, I really love the darkness of it uh, you were talking about the spirit of it being similar to metal and that's probably what i'm tapping into with that statement uh it has a very dark theme just conceptually and you can uh, feel that darkness in the music i'm also somewhat of an armchair historian fan of medieval history and had coincidentally just before i heard this album been reading a lot about the times of the black plague so that provided a good sort of uh mental imagery as a background for listening to this and it served that purpose the music that is really well um i do uh concede to your statement about how you had motifs that uh would emerge but not sort of be used to um develop and drive the pieces forward that's something i feel that you've improved on with goat craft over time um but uh that being said i just uh have most connected to the spirit of this album uh and the sort of radical darkness of it and the radical um sort of uh, transgressiveness of the subject matter a really uh intense meditation on death so I agree with Shelley. I would put it up in around the same area as the Alwyn album is. And speaking about the radicalism, um, that's probably how I, I don't view it as radical enough now. Like when I was talking about like listing and omni tonality, that's you know working just within chromatic scales. And I, I know when I wrote Yersinia Pestis, I primarily wrote pieces in C sharp minor, uh, C sharp, um, and so they, they are diatonic. And I'm completely done with that now. It's like you can learn, you know, music theory in the classroom and, you know, you can dissect a go-craft song. I want to create pieces that you can't really dissect in reference to other things as, you know, make it more radical, not serialism or anything like that, but creating, you know, like the chromatic background that's still musically inclined, but just beyond. Um, so, and you, you look at late lists, he did that. And it's very, very introspective, more introspective than his most popular, you know, works in his mid period and all that. Like late list is where it's at for introspective piano music. And that's kind of what I'm considering nowadays. Um, but yeah, um, so I mean, I think I think the fact that people struggle to place Grocraft because it's not dark ambient, it's not neo folk. Um, you could argue, make a case to say it's sort of neoclassical. But I think that for that reason, it that's almost telling us to the fact that it does stand apart. There are literally no other projects like this. Um, and yeah, you, you can talk about the fact that you have developed as a musician. And I, I understand that. I hear a lot of that from you know musicians looking back on past works and so on. 
but there's still an element well it, it resonates with a listener base and i don't i don't think it's got the audience that it deserves but um so yeah you can sort of see both sides in terms of you seeing this as a remnant of a much younger you but also the fact that it still it still you know has has value as far as an audience is concerned yeah i mean if someone else came out with uh your Cindy and Pestis, I would give him props saying good job. Um, because I, I I understand there there are, you know, I, I got excited when I wrote some of those pieces and I, some of the melodies in there. Um, I was happy to, you know, create and put into songs. Um, but yeah, uh let's just move on. Um you know, look, you know, analyzing myself is probably the worst thing to do on this podcast because <laughs> I'm never fucking happy with anything that I create, I might be happy, you know, like right afterwards. And then, you know, time goes by. I'm like, I should have done this. I should have done that. It's like, why did I stop there? I should have, you know, brought this you know, idea back and developed that further. And, you know, just looking back on things, I, I, I do kind of pick it apart. Um, well, I know you and said, every other musician, man. Yeah. I was going to say, I noticed you've moved the Bruckner up to S, but wasn't he also famous for doing exactly that? <laughs> Yeah, he he revised his music. Um, so um, other he has he did not revise the symphony because he died, um, while he was writing it. So this is a, uh, I moved Anton Bruckner's uh, Ninth Symphony, uh, conducted by Hans Rugner. I think so. You pronounce his last name. Uh, I believe wasn't he on the, the east side of the wall? Um, I think he uh, the you know the Berlin Wall. I think it was on the the east side of it. Um. As a conductor, uh, feel free to correct me on that. But uh, the reason why I chose this specific conductor is that out of all of the more modern recordings, he's the closest to Furt Vongler that I've heard. Um, Furt Vongler is very organic with the time signatures. It, it just, you know, Bruckner's music is very flowing and in the right conductor's hands, you know, it can be even more flowing and more profound. And uh, Rugner is a, a great conductor in that regard, especially the third movement where the the sonic vortex opens up and, you know, it's just pure dissonance and destruction. And it, it, it just flows so great in this specific recording. Um, so Anton Bruckner, he died while writing the Ninth Symphony. Um, so there is no finale. Um, actually, he was writing parts of the finale. And, you know, th there are aspects of the finale that are completely orchestrated. And that's why other people have come in and tried to complete it. I view the best completions as being a uh, Sebastian Ladokar and the William Kerrigan. Uh, uh, Ladokar is a uh, very, uh, it, he, uh, the, the massive coda in the first movement of the symphony, he rearranges it and repackages it for the, the coda and the finale. And it's just this powerful, ominous piece of music that he came up with. Whereas uh, William Kerrigan, his is a tad more uh, like you can kind of tell he was also really in the Mahler at the time. So some of the parts don't hundred percent sound like something Bruckner would have written, but uh, it's still a very flowing music, a great chunk, you know, great, you know, genius that went into, you know, coming out with that completion. So another thing about this album is when I chose it because, you know, it's so powerful, so dark. And the first time I heard it, it just completely fucking blew me away. It made me a, a Bruckner fanatic. Um, so he did die in 1896. And even like the last day he was alive, he was still working on a symphony. So like you guys were hinting at Bruckner, he did revise some of his works numerous times. You know, you look at the fourth symphony, um, I believe Benjamin Korsvet, who's the president of the Bruckner Society of America, he did uh, come up with a, a different version as well. Um, that exists out there. So I believe like with the fourth symphony, there's four different versions of it. There's a couple versions of the third, there's two versions of the eighth. Um, and, you know, musicologists are still trying to come up with the, the definitive Bruckner. And, but the, the thing about his ninth is obviously he died. Um, he didn't uh, have a chance to even complete it, let alone revise it. So technically in the way that Bruckner would compose, the symphony is still in draft form. Like even with the the three movements that exist, it's still in draft form because after he would complete writing a symphony, then he would kind of refine it and all that. So the music that's here is technically incomplete, but it's complete too, and it's just so wonderful. Like you, you, I have no idea like how much 
better he would have made this if he just stayed alive for another year or so to completely flush it out. But yeah, the, the first time I ever heard Bruckner's Nice Symphony, it just made just made me realize like, okay, this is the ultimate in uh, music. And uh, so I can go on and on and on about Bruckner, obviously, but uh, even in three movements, it's, it's, it's about an hour long. So very, very uh, broad and dense at the same time. So very broad landscape that he would orchestrate in and uh, really uh, uh, how everything flows together. Yes, it is in the sonata form. He wrote all of his symphonies in the sonata form. Here, you know, the third movement is not in the sonata form. That's the only one. I, I believe the, the scherzo and the allegro are in the sonata form. So, um, but not the... The Adagio, I don't believe that's in sonata form because you have this huge vortex and the Fox conclusion or the Faux conclusion. Why did I pronounce the X? But anyway, um, yeah, it's just a complete massive. Uh, it's very introspective too. The, once you, you know, sit down and listen how the music unfurls. You know, like we said, it is in sonata form, so the mo motives reemerge and they become more and more powerful. Um, and you reach that coda, the first one is one of the best. Codas I've ever heard, probably my all-time favorite with the the counterpoint that's going on and how all the the instrumentation comes together just to create this grand statement. Um, Scherzo I've heard as being compared to Metallica and all that with how uh, abrasive and quote-unquote bouncy it is. Kind of sounds like uh, guitar riffs, um, you know, chugging along in a metal band. <laughs> And it is, you know, very, very powerful. And but the the adagio, like I, I've heard from other guys too, it's like they prefer it in three movements. And it's like stop debating about you know the what's left of the um the finale and people completing that and everything too. When Bruckner died, um he uh a lot of people came to his uh, apartment and took you know parts of his manuscripts as souvenirs. Um, so there's probably still material out there from the Ninth Symphony just that hasn't been returned um, or to return to the, the limelight, essentially. But, uh, yeah, it's really sad that he was unable to complete it. And uh, I still love this album. Um, Shelley, have you ever listened to the Ninth Symphony by Anton Bruckner? Well, yes, I, I knew that we would be discussing it in this episode, so I thought I'd better give it a spin. Um, so. Well, I'll preface what I'm saying again by saying I'm not referring to you here, Jason, because I know that you are an avid kind of classical music scholar in your own right. But I think um, a lot of uh, metalheads tend to listen to or be interested in classical insofar as it has similarities to or is influence, influential upon metal. And Bruckner is, is, is something of a favourite in that regard for obvious reasons. I myself... I don't. I tend to listen to classical as a form in its own right, and my love of it is entirely separate from the reasons why I love metal. Hence why I said earlier on that I don't really get on with large symphonies or pieces written for large orchestras. There are pieces that I love. We've, you know, we've done a whole episode on the Beethoven symphonies, for example, and some of them are some of my favorite pieces of music. But for classical, I tend to go for solo pieces or quartets and so on um with that out of the way i will say i did really enjoy this piece um i thought for such a long piece of music i was impressed with how tight and coherent it was um maybe that's partially due to the sort of really well developed themes good use of repetition um when it counts i thought that was um really really effective um but I, this is also going to be considered blasphemy, but I tend to sort of favor Mahler in that regard, even though he tended to write much more bloated, unfocused, kind of weighty pieces. But for some reason, his fluidity kind of resonates with me um, a little bit more. So I will say, like, mine should only really be considered half a vote because I was only really studying this piece properly on Friday. I've not really spent any great deal of time with it compared to some of my other favorite composers. Uh, but for me, yeah, I would I would place it around B for now just because that's where that's where it kind of sits for me when I sort of rate it against uh pieces by uh comparable comparable composers. Oh 
that, that was a uh, sheer blasphemy. Um, <laughs> you know, one day you'll 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 get to Bruckner and you'll realize that his music is much more going on with his music than uh, the Mahler. Um, Tyler, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm much more uh, with you, Jason. Uh, out of my top ten favorite musical artists, um, period, uh, Bruckner is one of the uh, most honored uh, in that list. So I'm familiar at least with his symphonies, and I have listened to some of his non-symphonic works. But with his symphonies, I'm familiar with the entire corpus, and so of course this is one of my favorites. Um, my introduction to Bruckner, and it's a bit of a strange introduction, but it was just happened to be the first one I listened to was his sixth symphony, but I quickly branched out to all of the, uh, rest of the works in his, um, and, uh, the ninth, of course, immediately appealed to me, especially coming into classical music from being, listening mostly to heavy metal. Um, and as we've mentioned many times before, there are many differences between heavy metal and classical music, but the manner in which Bruckner appealed to me the most coming from a heavy metal background, and I feel like the Ninth Symphony is one of the uh, most prevalent examples of this, is that it is very powerful music, and not just powerful in the sense of being sonically powerful, although that's certainly an aspect of it, um, but in the sense that it sounds larger than life it sounds like something very dramatic perhaps or uh to use a somewhat cliched term epic is unfolding before you um i've uh, heard people sometimes compare this symphony in particular to sounding like the creation of the universe uh which i think is at least one apt analogy for it um the coda to the first movement uh really hits you like a freight train it is extremely um exhilarating and really kind of uh fills you up with a sense of uh awe at the beauty of existence uh i could go into all sorts of really bad poetry about how amazing uh bruckner is um about how amazing this symphony is uh the scherzo i've seen that numerous times uh, referred to in uh, drawing connections between heavy metal and classical music, as Jason said. Um, you know, in heavy metal, you typically have, with its more riff-oriented structure, more a uh, higher degree of repetition than you hear in a lot of classical music. Uh, but Bruckner also likes to make use of repetition, especially in uh, movements like the scherzo from this symphony. And so, yeah, you do get something that somewhat more closely approximates a riff structure. Um, so it's a really good in way into classical music for heavy metal fans. And I'm, I've always been someone who suggests that uh, heavy metal fans check out classical music, just because if you appreciate powerful, epic sounding music, uh, classical music has a lot of opportunities to scratch that itch. And when I do suggest that to metal fans, Bruckner is one of my foremost suggestions. And this would probably be one of the symphonies that I would perhaps uh, recommend for investigating Bruckner if you haven't before, along with something like perhaps the fourth, just because that's a common introduction to Bruckner. But the ninth, absolutely phenomenal, extremely powerful music, sometimes almost diabolical um, it's dark too. Like it's it's dedicated to God, but it, there's some real darkness in uh, the ninth. Um, so it's yeah. The, the fourth, I would agree, uh, would be just a a good introductory symphony for someone who likes like general romanticism. Um, granted, that's when Bruckner was quote unquote matured. But you look at his Ovoir and all the symphonies, even the 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 F minor and the the d minor the the quote unquote zero and double zero um they're very very mature works of music and you, you can tell like he was really inspired by uh beethoven and schubert when he wrote those um oh yeah, yeah i just listened to the first symphony the other night and it's it's still incredibly valuable even though it's not part of what's considered his mature works which like you said is the fourth onward 
Well, even the third, um, because he did revise that later in life. Um, but uh, yeah, um, I, when we talk about the maturity of Bruckner, I think it's kind of arbitrary nowadays, especially with the the twists and turns that classical music has taken. Where you know, perhaps uh, you know, especially like more modern composers like Ivo Part and you know guys like that, Philip Glass, like Bruckner is a thousand times more sophisticated and more mature, technically, you know, speaking. So, uh, yeah, um, so this S tier for you, right? Oh, absolutely. All right. So I think uh, it just puts it in the A because um, we did have one dissenting voice today. Um, Yeah, so he likes Mahler better. What's, what's up with that? Mahler, guys, dude, like – they just do not get Bruckner. I'm part of the Mahler group, and all the time people are throwing shade at Bruckner. And what they do is they, they talk about a lot of like Bruckner's you know quirks and all that. Yes, he was in the death and counting leaves on trees and you know proposing to teenage girls and all that. Who cares? It's like listen to I'm not the- part of I'm not part of an anti Bruckner syndicate. I just really like Mahler. Like <laughs> There, there was a fucking the rumor going around that Bruckner wore rub, rubber underwear, and I think uh, Look, that I'll g- let you put it in S if it will make you feel better. Like I don't mind. I'll move it between <laughs> S and A. But you understand, uh, we have an S, you know, thing that's rated below an S. Wasn't Mahler himself quite a fan of Bruckner, though? Like, didn't he stand were, up for panels. him on numerous occasions? Yeah. yeah, I think they were friends. Yeah, they were. Um, so we we spent too much time on Bruckner. I think, uh, uh, yeah, that was way too much time just on ranking one thing. But uh, um, Endura Black Eden. Um, that's another one of my choices. I I always thought this was metal adjacent, it has like ambient and neo folk and kind of deck and dance vibes here and there. Um, but the reason why it succeeds is also the reason why it fails. So it paints a great atmosphere and, you know, keeps the same repetition going on and on. And it's like wonderful, wonderful. But that repetition, it's just like there's each song is like literally one idea. And with that, I, I like our Dead Can Dance is coming up and I, I feel that Dead Can Dance, you know, flushed their music out a lot better than Endura did. So I would put that as a C. Um, Black Eden by Endura, it does paint a great atmosphere, but each song is literally one idea, you know, repeated for like nine minutes. Um, and that's why I think it's, you know, it's great. And it's also kind of bad um, that there's not more development. How about you, Shelley? Yeah. So before we started recording, uh, Tyler and I were discussing like the minimum requirement for an ambient album is that it creates a great atmosphere. Like if you fail to do that, you fail the ambient. But the thing that makes the really great bands stand apart, like you mentioned, we've got Dead Can Dance and Tangerine Dream coming up is doing something more not just maybe a musical development but a development of an idea a theme something um but yeah this endure album um i love the way it mixes kind of the sophisticated aspects of like dark ambient with you know borderline kind of 90s geek cheese in some places but i don't mean that disparagingly i mean that in a really good way um and i like the use of the more sharp the sharper timbres mixed with like the background canvas of textures um i think they sort of build those up and contrast them really well um and it paints a very kind of minimalist but you know sometimes engaging like uh melodic um palette but as you say it is still very very underdeveloped um i think also the use of actual you know vocals and the, the chanting kind of lends it a sort of very eerie kind of what I'd call theologically um, anxious kind of experience. Um, but yeah, given given what we're discussing here, I, I do think that the stasis of the album and the fact that it doesn't really move these ideas forward across these pieces, I would say I'd maybe put it between a B and a C. Yeah, I think I'd be happy with where it is now. All right, Tyler. Um, so yeah, I listen to Endura quite a bit and uh, more so than... I guess other neo folk bands, although in some ways Endura kind of bucks some of the neo folk trends. Um, but um, and this album is a pretty good, pretty good example of their style. If it was something like a Great God Pan or Libra Leviathan, I might rate it a little higher. Um, 
but the consensus on it about fits my feelings about the album. Uh, it does a good job of creating an atmosphere and uh, it has some really uh, captivating themes from time to time. Um, the themes don't ever really develop into a moment of profound realization, like even the best of death metal does. Um, but uh, it does create a uh, very engaging uh, dark atmosphere. One of the reasons I like Endura better than other neo-folk groups sometimes is that uh, they have a more thorough sense of darkness about them um, that I am I can relate to a little more than some of the more, um, I don't know, pagan or natural uh, themes that you find in other neo-folk groups, even though all neo-folk groups kind of go for a darker sound. So yeah, I'd probably put it at about a C too. All right, so that stays in the C. So I wanted to include Lord Wind um, on this tier list. However, Shelley came down with a rule of no side projects of metal musicians. So, um, <laughs> Sounds mate. So uh, I, I chose the next best thing to <laughs> Lord Wind, which is obviously its main influence, is the Conan soundtrack. Um, I feel that Lord Wind actually is better than the, the, <laughs> the Conan soundtrack more compelling but it's it's entertaining um there's nothing offensive in it um definitely a lot of you know folkish melodies and you know orchestrated and drawn out and you know creates like you know a good barbarian movie soundtrack um yeah i would put it as you know it's kind of middle of the road um especially compared to the bruckner um so just as a c how about you shelly the thing I love about Conan is obviously it's like a favorite of metalheads, um, but in the sort of wider canon of film aficionados, it's sort of listed as a B movie. But you watch it back and you listen to the soundtrack, and it actually comes across as really big budget. Like it harkens back to the glory days of Hollywood in the 50s and 60s when they were making historical epics with huge sets and vast numbers of extras and these glorious, like sweeping soundtracks and so on. And, you know, as as the studio system kind of burnt itself out, you had a budgeting independent kind of explosion in the 70s with like smaller exploitation films and so on. And Conan came out in, I think it was like 1981. So it's like almost like a callback to a, a time that films forgot in a way. And the soundtrack really speaks to that in just creating this huge, immersive, epic kind of world for you to get completely lost in. And um although you know it is kind of considered a silly sword and sorcery source sword and sorcery excuse me film i think it is it is a bit more serious than that and the plot is still really tight the film itself is really well made despite the fact that you can laugh at aspects of it like arnold schwarzenegger punching a camel and so on and i think the part of that is the soundtrack it's sort of it's so uh tight well composed varied like that yeah there's aspects of sort of ritual pagan music there's choral chanting there's just classic hollywood kind of orchestration um it, yeah it has it all and i i think it's a fucking enjoyable listen in its own right i would maybe rank it a b to be honest oh all right uh tyler so yeah uh let me see if i can pronounce his name like in the appropriate Greek, uh, Vasil uh, Polidoris. Uh, he's a pretty good composer overall. He also did the soundtrack for uh, The Hunt for Red October, if I'm not mistaken. And that soundtrack is also fairly decent. Um, obviously, you can hear the influence of this soundtrack on Lord Wind, but like Jason, I feel that Lord Wind is superior. In some ways, this soundtrack falls victim to trying to sound like Hollywood's idea of medieval music, but not nearly as badly as many other examples within the film soundtrack canon. Um, there are some really beautiful themes at times. Uh, one of the things that I like about it, and I'm sure that Jason maybe doesn't have the same opinion of this particular composer, is that it really reminds me at times in slightly of uh, Otterino Respighi, um, who was a huge influence on film soundtracks in general. Um, but you hear some of that, especially in this soundtrack and some of the pieces like, um, riddle of steel, uh, has really beautiful theme in it. Um, there's some really, uh, kind of, uh, almost so cheesy. They're good 
pieces uh, like I can't remember the name of the piece, but when Thulsa Doom and his thugs are attacking the village that Conan lives in as a child, really good piece there. Um, so yeah, overall, it's uh, one of the better examples of film soundtracks. I kind of wish that film soundtrack sounded more like this rather than the later two trends of either a uh, kind of schmaltzy but indistinguishable uh, string soundtrack that you hear in like a uh, like a George Lucas film um, or the more popular Hans Zimmer soundtrack of uh, pads, 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 and more pads. Um, so yeah, I think I would give this about a C as well. All right. Um, I believe that puts it between a, a B and a C. Um, gentlemen, I know we, we went too long on a Bruckner and Raphael hasn't joined us. Um, would you like to keep his recommendations on here and go quickly through them or save them for last and do that if we have time? Or like, what are your thoughts? Should we remove it since we did kind of go too long on the Bruckner? I'm, I'm happy to do them. I, I've got a few things to say about them, so I want to, I want to keep them in. Okay, just making sure. Um, uh, I know there's there's time constraints and all that. So, uh, uh, Shelly, um, I'll let you introduce uh, your picks. So, first up is uh, Dead Can Dance. Yeah, so I don't think Dead Can Dance need any introduction for metalheads in general. They're kind of one of the um, the go-tos, as it were. But the thing about Dead Can Dance, especially in the 80s, is they're one of these defining genre-spanning bands in that you get fans of electronica, goth, industrial, metal, and that sort of vague um, conglomerate referred to as world music um, into them. So they, they have this real kind of cross-section of appeal. And the reason I picked Within the Realm of the Dying Sun, it's not only one of, possibly one of my all-time favorite albums, definitely in the top five, um, is it kind of bridges the gap between the earlier goth infused dark ambient dark wave style and the later soundscaping come world music style that they kind of morphed into and the things to know about dead can dance is so i've been into them since i was a teenager and it's like the kids really love the the lisa gerrard stuff where she's got this beautiful soaring um enchanting voice um, you know, it's become part of the popular psyche. She's done very famous soundtracks like the film, uh, the soundtrack to the film Gladiator and so on with Hans Zimmer, <laughs> of all people. Um, but then as you get older and you mature, you actually start to realize that Brendan Perry um, is sort of the engine room of the genius of Dead Can Dance. Not only are his lyrics very, very uh, subtle, but intelligent, but also he has a really um intuitive way of putting pieces together and a very sort of he's almost like part poet part musician in a lot of ways and as, as you get older you really do become captivated by by what he does um across deck and dance albums and within the realm of dying sun not only stands apart as being the high point of both of their kind of musical expressions but also it is literally a split album in that brendan perry handles the first half lisa gerald the second and brendan perry like you've got tracks like Xavier, which really kind of brings out the best of both dark ambient and dark wave and the remnants of goth and then it has you know an almost anthemic chorus but it's such a dark kind of all in all consuming sort of foggy piece much like you know the entirety of the first half but for me even though i'm quite a bit older now it's still all about lisa gerrard here like that there, there are moments on here that are just absolutely sublime it just she's got like three octaves in her voice tracks like the close of persephone the gathering of flowers which is shaped like an overture just really showcase what she's capable of as as a singer um and you know moments like summoning of the muse where it's it's almost like a both literally in terms of the way it's composed but also the experience of it, it is just like walking through a cathedral and just touching the sublime um it's very hard to encapsulate that in what is essentially you know, a pop album. These these guys came from like a post punk background. Brendan Perry played in a post punk band before he was in Dead Can Dance. So did Lisa Gerrard. And just to come out with like that and the budgeting eighties dark wave movement uh, into this um, is is really just a remarkable achievement for 
an artist of this standing. So yeah, if you haven't guessed it already, I'm I'm putting this in S. Um, so yeah, what's your what's your thoughts, Jason? Well, there's no way I'm putting it in S with Bruckner being between an S and an A. I'm sorry, Shelley. Look, J- Jason, if I let you have Bruckner as an S, or you can just put it above S like you did with Blessed of the Sick, are you going to rank it where you think it should be? I'm going to start rubbing my hands together here. It's time to haggle. <laughs> Today is my birthday. Yes, it is your birthday. And as a special treat for you, you'll have Bruckner up there. He'll just be a Happy separate birthday, from me. Jason. Yep. Glory to Brooklyn. All right. So uh completely echo everything Shelly said, especially that Brendan Perry is the uh genius behind that can dance. A lot of people get you know wooed over by that Lisa Gerard. However, I find that uh yeah, Brendan Perry is the, the guy behind it, the the genius and um completely phenomenal musician. Um Dead Can Dance is a a band it took me a while to get into because I thought it was just really like straightforward music and I liked, you know, more surprises with the music, but it's just so well put together. And over 10 years now, I've been a huge fan of Dead Can Dance. I actually went to uh, Houston one time with that, you know, I was hanging out with that Brett Stevens guy from deathmetal.org and I went by a record shop and I was just going through stuff and he was like, all right. He just handed me this Dead Can Dance album and he was like, buy this. It was the one that came before this, um, Aeonian or whatever. But, uh, um, and I, I, I an ideal. Yeah. And I, uh, you know, I popped it in and, you know, I actually spent some good time with it. And, uh, um, yeah, ever since then, I've been a huge fan of Dead Can Dance. I've tried to work some of, uh, not, I haven't ripped them off or anything, but I, I've worked like Dead Can Dance types of melodies into my own music at you know different times and uh yeah uh it, they, they they also like you're saying like you know half of it's poetry i agree with that and they, they paint like a very ancient type of atmosphere like you look at you know plato people say that plato was against music um in the republic but he was against music for the commoner um and i i view it more like uh this is more of you know like uh praising uh you know things beyond mundane existence and uh that's what true you know artistic expression is about in my opinion and dead can dance definitely has that um and they have one of the songs on here is just complete gibberish too it's not even words being sung <laughs> that guitar or whatever song is uh not even a real word well, she's she often sung in a made-up language a lot of her pieces across many albums are like that where she's just chanting yeah, it's called Glossalia. That's yeah. it, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um so in that regard, it definitely isn't mundane at all because there's no you know words, you know, of the the physical representation of reality that we experience in our waking lives. So yeah, uh definitely an S for me. Uh Tyler, what are your thoughts? I would put this as an S tier too. Uh this might be considered uh really insulting to some uh listeners who are really into ancient music and i also like a good deal of medieval music myself but dead can dance has somewhat of a leg up on even some actual authentic medieval music and that uh coming much later in time uh they have more structure to their music and what's happening um i like that both shelly and jason the both of you guys mentioned that brendan perry's uh, contributions can be undersung uh, due to the sort of uh, immediate appeal of Lisa Gerard's voice, because uh, some of Brendan Perry's, I shouldn't say pieces, because I don't know exactly what the composition credits are on this record, but some of the ones where he's more prominent, like Xavier, uh, actually have a pretty decent amount of development for a neoclassical band that typically focuses a little bit more on achieving atmosphere than it does on developing theme. Um but overall, all of the tracks on this album are uh, excellent and uh, probably really benefits from straddling the line between their earlier uh, sort of gothic influenced material and their later world music in- material. And that the synthesis between the two results in something that kind of almost resembles a melancholic look at uh, classical aesthetics classical proper as in the classical period of history like uh the um times of uh ancient greece not necessarily like western music classical um 
And aesthetically, just all across the board from the music to even the album cover, you can see that they have kind of really united everything into a complete package with this record, which is why I think it's a, a perennial favorite of uh, metalheads at the very least. Um, it's a very dark record. And uh, even from the opening track, you get a sense of darkness in the melody that can uh, almost be reminiscent of uh, Burzum at times. And in fact, I believe that uh, Varg Vikernes has listed this band as uh, something of an influence at various points. Um, so yeah, I would say out of all neoclassical music, Dead Can Dance is definitely one of my favorites across several of this record of their records, and that this one in particular is a top favorite of mine. S ranking fits just well for me. Cool, cool, cool. All right, Shelly, you want to introduce your your next band here, Tangerine Dream? Uh, yeah, so Tangerine Dream, um, again, another band that doesn't really need much introduction. Um, the reason I picked this album um, from a band that has a considerable discography, to put it mildly, um, is similar to Within the Realm of Dying Sun, is it straddles two different periods for this artist. So this was their third album, um, and Tangerine Dream kind of came out of the kraut rock scene in the late 60s, which is it's probably a very oversimplification to say it was like the German answer to British psych come early progressive rock. In But the kraut rock style was much more loose and informal and abstract and improvisational. And you get that on the first two Tangerine Dream albums where they're still essentially hippies that are very interested in space and cosmology and being you know treating the uh, celestial realm with a sense of like reverence um and on alpha centauri you kind of you do get that where there's this mix of very early ambient drone with hangovers from you know the psychedelic hippie phase of the late 60s with these very loose jazzy drums use of flutes use of guitars um, Zeit was released in 1972, and that's when Tangerine Dreams started to become what I would say is more brutalist, in that they didn't view space with the late 60s sense of optimism and more of a sense of expressing the vastness, this this vast unknowable realm, and also kind of tapping into a more urbanist kind of expression where they became what I would essentially call modernist in the fact that their expression was much more nihilistic, much more um, dark and much more expansive in a lot of ways. And on Zeit, it's not really ambient in the way that we understand later Tangerine Dream and that they're using these sequenced arpeggios that slowly develop and like layer up on one, one another. This is more like drone music that uses these vast swelling textures that rise up over the course of several minutes at times and then slowly descend away again and they're using you know early synthesizers to express this they're using stringed instruments they are using guitar noise as well it's still quite an organic kind of collection and very informal again there is a sense of improvisation going on but i really like this idea of them suddenly their expression just expanding to encapsulate the vastness of what they want to encompass with their you know preoccupations with space and so on um so that's why i picked zeit not necessarily my favorite tangerine dream album to listen to because it is essentially a drone album so i think it's one of their most important works objectively but as as from a pure listening experience probably not my favorite so i'm gonna rank it about an a i think jason yeah um i uh Oh shit! I, I really don't want to dissent on this. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. I'm just That's waiting for Jason to say he hates Tangerine Dream or something like that. I hate some of their fans. Yeah, um, I, it's a lot of the the boomer rocker. You know, people they get into Tangerine Dream and smoke weed. It's like, wow, this is fucking profound and all that. But there's also you know fucking metalheads into Tangerine Dream and. I mean, that's kind of why I picked this album, because the first two albums, I could definitely see that boom and a weed smoker thing. But this album is way more, well, heavy, essentially. Yeah, um, 
but also I, I hardly ever revisit Tangerine Dream personally. Um, I can appreciate it. Um, and I I do know the the genius of some of their compositions here and there. And like we were talking about the uh, the Endura, um, their Tangerine Dream songs go places. The uh, Endura just stays there in a, the atmosphere. Um, it was just, just floating in the atmosphere, looking at the clouds and all that. Um, Tangerine Dream takes you on voyages. Um, so yeah, I, I'm gonna put it as a between an A and a B, honestly. Um, I when it comes to some of the you know ambient classics, like I know we're getting up to uh, Schultz uh, later. Schultz, um, it's more of like if I'm in the mood for it, then I'll listen to it, but. Beyond that, it doesn't seem like profound music to me personally. I know other people who've exp experimented with like hallucinogenics and all of that. It's like eye opening, you know, profound spiritual experience for them. But for me, I I I, I haven't encountered that. So um, I'm gonna put it between an A and a B, honestly. Um, I when I do listen to it, I do enjoy it, but I'm not really compelled to revisit. Um, I know Tyler. Um, like he may uh, view it a lot higher than I do. So go ahead, Tyler. I do view it a lot higher than you do. Um, Tangerine Dream is another one of my uh, top 10. Uh, probably Rubicon and Phaedra are what I would consider S rank albums, but I do listen to this album quite a lot, uh, b partly for the reasons that uh, Shelley um, expounded upon that this album is a, has a lot more drone to it than Rubicon and Phaedra do. They have a little bit more of a sense of development uh, than Zeit does. But uh, this album still is a really excellent example of ambient music that, as Jason said, actually develops and can lead you from one place to another. It doesn't just simply accomplish uh, generating an atmosphere or like some of the worst of ambient accomplish sounding like somebody left their air conditioner on. Um, so it's really... Uh, excellent record. It does have a very powerful darkness to it, as uh, Shelley was alluding to when he was talking about the album, uh, a lot more than their earlier works, for sure. You got tastes of that on Alpha Centauri, but this uh, this album really kind of, almost in a slightly Lovecraftian way, uh, gives you hints of some of the horrors of the vastness of space and contemplating really... Uh, the seeming emptiness of it, you know, as far as we're aware, not there not being anything comparable to our existence here going on out there. Um, and uh, that can really give you a sort of scope as to the relevance of your life and your actions. Uh, and so Tangerine Dream actually is pre pretty metal on this record, which is why I think that they are a frequent recommendation for uh, metalheads. So yeah, I would put it as an A. All right, that averages out to an A. Um, like I said, it's one of those things that I don't feel compelled to revisit often, but when I do listen to it, I do enjoy it. So I, I have more positive things than negative to say about it, but I, I you know, obviously I'm in the classical music quite a bit and I do like musical content. Uh, regardless of uh, I me mean, talking about mystical omni tonality and all that, but um, I, I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, we, we've talked about Arthur Schopenhauer um, in the past and, you know, I wrote that paper on, you know, Bruckner's scene through his aesthetics. I, I just wonder what the fuck, you know, Schopenhauer would think of like ambient music, like Tangerine Dream, you know, with these, you know, soundscapes. Um, but anyway, uh, Maybe he might hold it in you know high regard like he does did with a uh, Western classical. Um, Shelley, your next album, the punk music. <laughs> well, I kind of cheated with Amoebix because this is as metal as punk gets without actually just being metal. But the reason I picked Amoebix is not only is it one of my favorite punk albums, but I think I hold this in higher regard than I do quite a lot of the canon of extreme metal. Um, it is much like Dead Can Dance, it's a genre-spanning cross-appeal album. There's elements of post-punk, there's elements of industrial, there's elements of straight-up you know, hardcore and cross-punk, there's elements that are in affinity with bands like Celtic Frost. Um, Amoebics are from Bristol, um, and they squatted a lot there, and that's sort of in the West Country of the UK. 
which for anyone that's not familiar with the geography of this country, that's the kind of area where Glastonbury is. You've got Stonehenge, you've got Salisbury Plain. There's a lot of um, remnants of our pre-Christian pagan, pre-Roman, I should say as well, uh, sort of pagan past there. It's a very kind of mystical, atmospheric, spiritually enriching place. And I think that's one of the things that made Amoebic so special as a punk band in that they were socially conscious, they were um, very anarchic and they did write a lot of political lyrics, but they also were very in touch with this earthy, um, spiritual, um, almost esoteric kind of um, undertone to a lot of it, which I think is why this album and some of their other works have stood the test of time far more than comparable bands. Um, you could say, you know, a band like Discharge as well, because their lyrics were kind of so vague that they kind of just worked like um, single lines to sing over this these chugging like air raid siren guitar riffs. But I think with Amoebix, they, they offered a much more diverse kind of package. Um, so for me, again, no surprises, it is one of my all time favorite albums. But I kind of put this in here as a as a stand in for all of punk. So I could have put in discharge i could have put in dri or um cryptic slaughter or well even a killing joke album for instance but i feel like this one kind of encapsulates why punk in the early to mid 80s was so affiliated with metal but also a little bit antagonistic in that there was this kind of almost arms race of who can out um what's the word not out extreme the other but outclass the other as far as creating the ultimate kind of transgressive statement the ultimate statement of anti-musical conventionality but amoebics kind of stepped away from that and although they're very primitive very basic musicians they they weren't trained at all let alone formally trained they didn't know how to tune their guitars for god's sake they still much like we talked about with celtic frost they still sort of transcended their own limitations to create this really profound um lasting resonant statement so yeah, again, I think all five of my albums are going to be in the S and A tier, which isn't really fair. But yeah, for me, this is an S album. Well, um, I'm withdrawing my vote. I, I don't like punks. I don't like punk. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm withdrawing. Oh, Do you not like any punk at all? I, I had a like a two day phase where I like crust, like nuclear death terror and shit like that. I do like you know, discharge. I mean, there there were a couple times I listened to discharge and I like that. But no, it's. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. If you don't like it, don't like it. Yeah, I, I'm just withdrawing my vote because if I were to be honest, um, it would just skew it beyond reason. So Tyler, go ahead. Well, uh, I'm a really big fan of this record. Um, there are some downfalls of it, which I'll go into a little bit of detail on. But yeah, I don't know if I would give it an S ranking. Um, but I do think this record is uh, a, a really excellent example of, uh, as uh, Shelley alluded to, punk, uh, or at least amoebics, uh, transcending its limitations. One of the things about this record that is really appealing is that it has a real, uh, a real uh, tenacity for sort of effectively shifting energy between two emotional extremes. So you have something that is almost more introspective uh, sort of um, like a repeated melodic figure that involving drone or like a kind of uh, subtly dissonant harmonization, uh, something that actually it kind of shares in common with music like Burzum um, that then uh, is transferred to something that's more akin to what you would hear in a lot of hardcore at the time. And this creates this really interesting effect where you kind of rather than just having a lot of punk music that sits in one or the other atmosphere of uh, sort of self-pitying introspection or um, futilely angry hardcore, something that almost uh, reveals a, a wider theme of the effects that uh, modern society has on the individual soul and its almost primitive desire to uh, live a life where it, your actions have some sort of meaning where they don't just feel like a uh, futile flinging into the void of uh, like symbolic gestures. So Amoebix does a really good job with this on this record. Um, 
the the downside to it that I would say, and it's minimal, is just that on sort of as the album goes on, you get a little bit more of like a kind of rock music or heavy metal styling, like the Right to Ride song from almost the end of the album is almost just a motorhead cover. <laughs> um and uh, to be to be fair, I think that is a bonus track. I don't think it was included on the original, but I do see where you're coming from with the motorhead thing. Right. Yeah. And Amoebic went more in that direction, arguably with Monolith. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, the, you know, the first half of this record and even the record as a whole is pretty excellent, but especially the first half of this record, um, you really get to see hardcore in its youthful exuberance uh, when it still has a lot of ambition and is, it isn't just sort of re- repeating an established stereotype. Um, and it's exploring a new territory. And uh, Amoebix is one of the finest examples of that. So I would give it probably an A ranking personally. All right. That puts it between an S and an A. And I, I do apologize. I've, I've had moments where I've gotten into punk, but they're very, very brief and short-lived. And I just wanted something more than energy, essentially. So um, useful energy at that. Um I or Shelly, um, I think uh, the biosphere will be an S for me, right? I mean, yeah. So, um, to speak on, I okay, where do I start with biosphere? It's like the this album uh, is the sort of culmination of everything that biosphere was trying to articulate in the nineties, and they're sort of they're an inheritor of some of the ambient that we've already been talking about in that regard. And that they they kind of came out of the early '90s like house rave scene, and their first two albums are reflective of that. They kind of fit into the um, oeuvre of like you know Orbital and the Orb, and uh, even you know Aphex Twin to some extent as well. And this sort of early intelligent dance music, although I know a lot of people don't like that um, particular moniker. And then Substrata is like the album where he fell into pure ambience and he moves away again from the inherent kind of urbanist expression of house music even though his version of it was still very minimal but he dispenses with the percussion and he really leans into this expression of um complete stasis uh because he's a norwegian artist living in the arctic circle he's obviously very heavily inspired by the very very slow literal glacial pace of events there not i say not life because a lot of his fascination was not just with um the stars and the galaxy in the solar system but also with ice and earth and rocks and just the fact that nothing really changes for many many years and his music started to kind of try to express that and you get this background texture that creates that vibe, but then you get sort of a musical textures occurring on top, which are kind of reminiscent of the sound of like animals or a rock falling and the way that sound reverberates very strangely around snowy and uh, snowy landscapes where there's not much vegetation. Um, And it's this wonderful combination of very traditional harmonic progressions alongside quite abstract almost sound art um techniques that really gives this album legs and again this sort of sense of unending longevity that he manages to express through this album is is absolutely sublime but having said that it is also very clearly a 90s album you get like the the twin peaks samples and you get vague references to dance music as well here and there just in some of the synth patches that he uses but it is a near perfect expression of what biosphere was going for at this point so yeah absolutely an s-tier album for me so yeah jason yeah i concur um s-tier for the biosphere substrata um i have actually listened to this album a lot more than a lot of metal um i love it to death because it's so counterintuitive to what I would personally create, you know, with music. Um, and it's because a lot of the aspects are non-musical and 
just the way he's able to intuitively put soundscapes together and like there's one part you know is you can you can tell there's um a fire burning and he's shifting around the logs and another part where it's just water dripping that's why i don't put it on when i'm sleeping <laughs> and um there's a just so much great creativity that got put into substrata and as it progresses like the first half of substrata i can you know i can listen to in any type of mood that i'm in but the second half i have to be in good spirits because if i'm not it fucking makes me depressed as hell it's just so fucking bleak holy it's a dark shit. album yeah yeah it's so fucking bleak and i there was one time i was working late um at a company and it was a uh, um it was end of the year and deadlines to meet and all of that and uh, and i walked outside and i was you know listening to biosphere as i was working and i walked outside and it was you know towards the end of the album it was started fucking snowing in san antonio and I was just like, this is just like the ultimate uh, experience, you know, listening to Biosphere and just the, the bleakness of it and the the dark, you know, scenery of snow falling down on top of it. And it, it, it created a, one of those like aesthetic experiences that I haven't been able to replicate. And I've also tried to do like a, some little aspects of like biospheres you know stuff in my music at different points in time and i never get to the level of genius that he had um it's more of just like oh yeah i like biosphere too there's a little the last one sick transit gloria mundi has one track that uh you know the piano music kind of stops and it gets to uh, ambient a little bit and i was really inspired by biosphere but like i said it's completely types this this music is not what i could create personally i could just have like some approximation of it but there's a level of uh intuitive nature there that it's just beyond uh, my understanding as a musician um because it's non-musical and it's because of that is why i i view it as very enduring uh tyler go ahead yeah, on the surface level, uh, Biosphere is an ambient group that kind of works in layers, especially on their uh, earlier records. Like this one, uh, you have a sort of looping pattern that adds sounds as the piece progresses. Uh, but underneath the surface, uh, you have what, in my opinion, is Biosphere's most powerful tool, which was alluded to by Jason talking about how it makes him de depressed, which is that it has unervingly incomplete melodies that kind of gesture at something lost or unfound and uh, it really creates a profound sense of like displacement um and almost kind of puts you a little bit into uh conflict with your mortality to a certain extent um and so it's surprising how something so cool uh and so calm and collected in a way uh can be so dark and so existential and because of that i think that biosphere deserves uh innumerable accolades for their work on this album definitely one of my favorite ambient albums and i would put it into an s tier for sure wow um we have that group thinking gatekeeping going on <laughs> oh my goodness fucking redditors um but yeah we all <laughs> agree that's uh the s tier um Shelly, would you like to introduce the next one? Yeah, okay. Uh, so King Crimson are another one. That, I mean, I I don't want to say I picked Low Hanging Fruit. I picked some of my all-time favorite albums, but King Crimson are another one that metalheads tend to like. Um, their first album kind of is the starting gun for the progressive era of rock. Um, I don't just mean progressive in the you know early 70s progressive rock i mean rock realizing its own potential like the beatles maybe hinted at it, at it a little bit but with king crimson you really get this idea that rock music is not just three four minute tracks of radio friendly maybe heavy pop music but it can actually be an ambitious project of soundscaping it can be a um backdrop for bacchanalian displays of technicality and really really um expressive forms of like threnody and lamentation and so on and you get all of that on the debut um king crimson 
after that, they released a number of albums around with a sort of revolving door lineup centered around the central figure of um, Robert Fripp, who is one of the most underrated guitarists in the sort of rock canon, in my opinion, even though he is held in very high regard amongst prog fans and King Crimson fans, I think in the sort of broader spectrum of, you know, you're talking of your, your Jimi Hendrix's, your Tony Iommi's, your Jimmy Page or whatever, he often gets overlooked as, as one of the uh, most bizarre geniuses of, of, of classic rock. Um, and by the time they released Red in 1974, it's kind of fitting in a way because King Crimson had sort of bookended the classic era of progressive rock. They'd started it off with the debut and here with Red, they um, they close it off with what can only be described as a nightmarish come down of undulating dissonance and disorientating. Um, what's the word? Just, yeah, this very kind of warping, uh, dark like scream from the abyss that uh just came out of nowhere um and they kind of solidified around this lineup of robert fripp john wett and bill bruford and bruford the drummer interestingly he had jumped ship from yes after they released uh close to the edge and yes a kind of the archetypical holdover of hippiedom in progressive rock in that they were very democratic they would always have discussions around oh should we move from this diminished chord to this like minor fifth or whatever or what time signatures that and they debate it endlessly whereas when he left yes and jumped to king crimson he said it was the exact opposite there was no conversation you were just supposed to know and you were also required to craft your comp- your own style completely unique to king crimson and not play that style in any other setting at all except for in king crimson and you kind of just lived under the dictatorial shadow of of fripp it was a bit like living in yeah totalitarian society in a lot of ways but all of the artists brought their own kind of completely unique expression to this and that culminates in red when they have a slightly more uh stable lineup and the other thing i love about this album is it almost anticipates metal far more than anything black sabbath ever did if you listen to some of the tracks on here fripp's approach to riffing was that he always said he was quite anti-riff. He didn't like riffs. Bearing in mind he was, you know, growing up and writing and making his name at the time when you had riffs like Smoke on the Water and and Led Zeppelin doing their thing and you know Black Sabbath who are an incredibly riff-based brand as well. So he was living under the shadow of like monster riffs. But King Crimson used riffs in a much more subtle way as a way to sort of develop themes. Riffs were almost like carriers for the theme in a way, in a way that you know, the hardware of a computer can carry a piece of software and so on. And they develop and express themes and evolve in a much more kind of organic way, in a way that anticipated a lot of how death metal would end up using riffs. And it's not one piece centered around this grand riff, this smoke on the water showstopper moment. Riffs are used to evolve a theme throughout a song and they're like carriers for a particular idea. And they they come out from various, various different angles as the song evolves. And you hear that, developing on red in a really kind of interesting and uh i don't know very subtle way um so yeah that was a very convoluted way of me saying this is another s tier album for me uh jason well shelly um i don't know if i should withdraw my vote or not because like punk music i'm not into prog um i will say that i did have a wonderful music professor who loved King Crimson. Um, and We had him on the podcast, didn't we? Yeah, Professor Godoy. Um, great guy. I love him. Um, yeah, uh, good little buddy of mine. Uh, very, uh, when it comes to music theory, he, you know, that's his forte. Um, I, I, I've fortunately met, you know, a lot of great professors now um, that do teach, you know, music theory and all that. And, you know, some of it has rubbed off on me. Um, yeah, he did actually uh, teach me theory after class. This one on one, he brought in a keyboard and went through a lot of different things, and uh, uh, which helped me understand the uh, playing music better um, from a more uh, academic sense, I should say. Uh, but uh, when it comes to King Crimson, I'm not a fan. Um, I, I understand that it, you you view it as like more of proto-metal than Black Sabbath, um, you know, 
in terms of a uh, you know painting narrative with riffs and all that and i'm just not a fan of prog i feel like if you want to be high minded with music um do it in a classical format or art music format i understand they did try to do like a pictures at an exhibition by Mussorgsky. um i believe that was king crimson um but so that just seems like novelty to me it's um it's not like as authentic as like if you listen to the actual piano music of pictures at an exhibition not the, the orchestrated version that uh Mussorgsky did not write the orchestrated version he was bad at orchestrating music but uh yeah i'm just gonna withdraw my vote because i think it would skew um its genuine placement on here as metal adjacent music go ahead tyler Ah, I thought I hit the mute button and I didn't. All right. So King Crimson to me um, on many albums that just their discography, but especially on this one, I think deserves uh, a lot more praise than just simply uh, being a good prog rock band. Uh, one thing that Shelly already uh, expanded upon a bit is that they uh, really are more about the pattern that, riffs or uh melodies fit into than just simply the sort of uh texture or experience of the the riff or melody in and of itself and so they kind of create a pattern language throughout the course of their music um that uh as shelley also said really got carried over into uh death metal um it's been said before, and I kind of follow this line of logic, that in a sense, you could call death metal the bastard child of uh, UK hardcore uh, progressive rock and uh, early uh, and early heavy metal. Um, and uh, you really hear it on part of that lineage on records like this. Um, they, of course, have elements of jazz and rock in the music. Um but there is somewhat more of a classical format to the music um, that uh, really kind of is able to rather ingeniously take a, a simple meme in a, in a pattern that's being played out and unveil the more complicated uh, like logical extent or consequences of that meme. Uh, something that you can kind of hear in a lot of uh, folk music from the British Isles, honestly, and kind of, I think, part of why folk music from that area was the foundation of a lot of rock music that came afterwards. Um, but yeah, we always make fun of Shelley for um, British music being badly represented on the podcast. And uh, today is kind of the opposite of that with Amoebix and King Crimson. He's really showing uh, some of the genius of uh british musicians throughout history um well the, the two that i withdrew my votes on you mean <laughs> yeah but i in my opinion they'll they're good rep they're fine representatives of quality uh british music at least more modern british music anyhow um, as far as metal is concerned we have a great supporting cast we just don't have any of the lead actors so <laughs> <laughs> right and the supporting cast truly is great because king crimson is excellent this record is a particularly good pick for metal adjacent music because in my opinion this record is probably their most metal record it is um on albums like uh you know fallen angel uh or on starless it really does in a very metal way kind of arrive at a uh, world shattering conclusion so to speak uh something that's heavy that hits you with its heaviness um but yeah, it's um, really probably the most uh, valuable contribution or close to the most valuable contribution King Crimson made was that sense of the various pieces of the music um, being looked at more as a pattern and what pattern does the movements of the melody create and how does that pattern uh, fit in with the other patterns that other melodies are weaving. Uh, something that you could kind of attribute to prog rock in general, but something that King Crimson was especially adept at. So uh, I would probably give this record more between an S and an A, but still very highly rated in my opinion. All right. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll move that between an S and an A because if I were to vote on it, I don't like prog, so... Um, I, I just think this is more 
representative of the podcast, you know, the general consensus. I understand there is a lot of value there in being metal adjacent, but yeah, uh, I'm a fan of uh, before, we, before we move on, um, I noticed you've placed the uh, schools already. Are we moving on to Tyler's albums first and then we'll discuss Raphael's? Oh, did, I, th- I thought you chose that one. No, no, not me. That was Raphael's pick. So we're done with mine now. I'll, I'll yeah. edit this panel, don't worry. All right, we got the camel. Um, for no, the, the first tricks. one for me is uh, Ya Portit, right next to camel. Or however you say their name. Little cave painting there. Yeah. Oh, you're right. Yeah, there was an additional one that was thrown on there. Um, where would you put that? Or yeah, Let me place it and you can talk about it. Where would you put it? Sounds good. Well, to start off, I would put this record at an A. Uh, Ya Portit is, I have a question about these guys to kind of begin my uh, analysis of it. Does this uh, does this man listen to black metal? <laughs> I'm pretty sure he does. <laughs> um, so the aesthetics, both visually and musically, just sound so much like he listens to black metal. Um, now, granted, later on, Yaportit kind of started incorporating more elements of post-rock. But honestly, the early Yaportit albums, my more uh, preferred ones, uh, almost sound occult uh, in how the melodies play out. There's a certain sort of darkness and mystery to them. Um, and in the canon of uh, ambient records, to me, that makes them a more interesting listen than the vast majority of ambient music, like Tangerine Dream. Uh, ya Portit kind of actually has some development going on that really kind of takes you on a journey, paints a landscape where you're moving from one point to another, and so can kind of convey an experience of sorts. Uh, but in other ways, like black metal, that journey can actually be um, somewhat of a dark experience. In some ways, this music can kind of remind you of uh, something like uh, summoning. Um, but yeah, uh, Ya Portit really solid example of ambient i on i feel like tangerine dream and biosphere are have some superior artistry uh but i feel like this is um sort of an artist that is a bit undersung in the canon of ambient music specifically in ambient music that's frequented by metalheads i feel like it's something that would appeal to a lot more metalheads especially uh fans of uh black metal as i've already said and uh like i said i think that uh i would definitely solidly put it in an a category uh what was it i don't know which one of you two is next jason <laughs> all right um so yeah uh I, I celebrated my birthday early last night and um i was drinking in my backyard listening to music and i remember checking this out and i don't remember <laughs> i remember checking it out but i don't remember the music so i apologize um i'm just going to go with your vote tyler yeah really good judgment yeah firm a for me because uh, Tyler knows what he's talking about. Go ahead, Shelly. So in my many, many, many hours of listening to the Dungeon Sin archives, I have come across this album a number of times, uh, just as when I'm listening to it as background music for work or whatever. Um, but in preparation for this episode, it was the first time I'd sort of given it a proper full-on listen. And um, yeah, there's elements about it that I really, really like. Um, it is a hell of a lot more dignified than a lot of you know, Dungeon Synth. I appreciate that this was released in the sort of pre-irony era of Dungeon Synth when it was even called such. I think this was released in like 99. So it was like when dark ambient black metal adjacent neo-folk was still, you know, loosely called that rather than rather than Dungeon Synth. So this kind of predates a lot of the sort of twee uh, hipster kind of iterations of that genre. Um, I really like the use of instruments instrumentation i should say with a sharper um with more attack to it like the you know the pianos and the harpsichords and the way that those instruments sort of decay into the background fuzz um that is essentially trying to achieve a similar thing to biosphere in that it's um creating a vast sense of stasis a frozen landscape that you are in in solitude but in a much more obvious and i guess you would say naturalist way i think biosphere is quite abstract in the way that they express that whereas this is much more sort of on the nose in terms of like the way that it wants to get across 
this sense of solitude in in the vast wilderness um and yeah for that it was really you know really quite compelling um there is still a bit of the kitsch and the twee for me though like it's still a little bit i wouldn't want to say knowing but just it it maybe maybe it's sort of tarred with the brush of what kind of dungeon sin became in the sort of 2010s onwards but yeah for me i'd rank it about a b i would say yeah and upon like another glance at the tier list you know having tangerine dream and a i actually kind of would probably put it more between an a and a b um because i do feel that tangerine dream is a little better um i definitely like your more detailed description of how it accomplishes uh, creating a sort of icy atmosphere, that feeling of stasis. A lot of ambient groups that have more cold themes use that technique and uh, several of them very effectively. Um, but yeah, I would say it would probably be between an A and a B. It's just a really nice ambient record and it's one that I return to fairly frequently, especially during colder months. Absolutely. Um, so next up is the camel do you want to introduce that one tyler sure so camel is another progressive rock band um they're quite different from king crimson in many ways they're probably closer to yes um in their sound in fact this record was originally supposed to be based on the book siddhartha by herman hess but because yes got there first with their album close to the edge uh they decided to redo the entire album and base it on a book called the snow goose ergo the title music inspired by the snow goose uh, which is a really touching story about world war one era britain and a young girl who makes friends with an artist who lives in solitude in a swamp and uh, they find a wild uh, snow goose that has an injured wing and nurse it back to health and then the artist gets called to war and uh never returns and shortly after he leaves the snow goose come is uh fully back to health and uh leaves a little girl grows up and she returns to the swamp to reminisce on her friend and the snow goose uh, returns and comes to see her and it's kind of a, supposed to be a somewhat touching analogy for friendship a little sentimental and uh, like progressive rock kind of had a tendency to be at times uh because it was trying to touch on more introspective themes but what i really like about this record is really kind of similar to things that I like about King Crimson or other quality uh, prog rock bands like early Yes or to a certain extent early Genesis, uh, which is they were moving away from the rock format of sort of just using um, riffing as a background for vocal melody to create a more static atmosphere and um, pushing rock towards using riffs as sort of a pattern language to uh, develop songs to a certain point where that point made sense and created a realization within the context of the overall piece um and also another thing that i like on a sort of more aesthetic level about this record is it has a lot of really interesting um instrumentation that's kind of inspired by medievalism um that uh creates some pretty pleasing uh, melodic sequences throughout the course of it i would probably put it uh, between a b and an a fair enough um i'll jump in next because uh no doubt jason might withdraw his vote because it's another progressive rock album but um fun thing about camel is they're actually from my hometown of guildford so i i live in leeds i have done for at least 15 years but i grew up in a town called guildford which is in the far south of england uh, between the south coast and london um, it's not a very big town as well. It's very middle class and a lot of the surrounding countryside is very twee and um, folky and what you'd, I guess what you would imagine when you think of like the rolling hills and woodland of England, which is where Camel are from. And it's quite fitting for a progressive rock band um, in the progressive rock combines a lot of that um, imagined folk aesthetic with the late 60s psychedelic blues explosion and camel kind of sit at the apex of that i'm a big fan of this album and uh mirage as well what i love about this album is not only the elements that you expanded upon tyler but the fact that a they got a lot of shit for releasing 
what is essentially an instrumental rock album, which just wasn't done in the early 70s. Um, again, this was the era of the the big, amph- almost, you know, the proto-rock anthem stadium kind of stuff going on. So you had the, you know, the silverbacks of classic rock writing their really sort of bombastic uh, material. And then you had Camel come out with this relatively delicate ballet of an album with no vocals, no you know, no showstopper piece. It's very kind of flowing, very intuitive music. It's quite fragile in a lot of ways. And to do that in the environment that they were working in took took some balls, even in their own genre in terms of like comparing them to someone like Yes or whatever. Close to the Edge is a very bombastic album and it's very heavy on the, the vocals as well. I love that album as well, but Camel Snow Goose is the inverse to a lot of that. But it is every bit as musically complex. The other thing I love about it, we're calling it a progressive rock album, but you barely would notice that there are guitars on it. I know there are, but a lot of the lead instrumentation is is flutes and, and woodwind. And you get a lot of sort of jazz flourishes along with these neoclassical flourishes as well. And I, I kind of, I love the understated balls of, of doing that. Um, whilst also working in pieces that are, really catchy you know you could you could imagine them being refrains on on a pop hit but they're kind of worked into these very complex nuanced little pieces little vignettes and the album itself is like 15 tracks but it it's treated as one track and that each track flows into the next and it's one continuous piece of music which is really done really really elegantly and could only really be done by very very studied uh musicians um I think I might I might be a little bit more generous. I don't rank rank it as highly as Red, but I would say, yeah, maybe an A album for me. But I'd be happy with between an A and a B. And I'm assuming Jason is gonna withdraw his vote. Yeah, I don't like Camel cigarettes. I I only smoke Doral. Um, That's the basis <laughs> for your vote. <laughs> they have the same logo as the Camel cigarettes. Um, I don't know if that was intentional or not, but. Um, yeah, I think, the, think the cigarettes predate the band. Oh, absolutely. But I mean they were certainly aping the 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 logo and even the imagery because I think the original cover from Mirage even had a camel on it that kind of oh, it does. Yeah, similar yeah, yeah. to the mascot. Yeah, no, I think that in the sleeve notes I've got they they do talk about that. Yeah. I was obviously being sarcastic just then, but yeah, you're right. I'm I'm gonna try my vote. I'm not into Prague. I, I apologize for that. Um, but yeah, I, I have very specific tastes and I, I look for transcendental aspects of music and I'm all lofty minded in that regard. And I apologize. Um, here's a, a lofty album. We got Brian Eno music for airports. Uh, Tyler, where would you put that before you talk about it? Um, so I would put it as an A album. Uh, I'll start with saying that there's some ambient records that I feel are better, like uh, Tangerine Dream, for instance, or uh, even Biosphere. But why I picked this one in particular is that I think that in large, and I'm not sure where it sits chronologically in um, the composing of ambient records, but especially for ambient that came out after it, Brian Eno kind of got there first and set the blueprint, um, not just with the uh, style, with the aesthetic of sparse instrumentation, uh, use of drone, but also with the sense of creating music that doesn't have subtext to it, for lack of a better way to put it, it does not. It's not necessarily conveying a message, uh, whatever that message may be. You know, a rather simple example being something like, uh, "My girlfriend broke up with me, and I'm sad about it." Um, you know, it really is just music that is just uh, happening. You know. And uh, in a way that's almost like nihilistic, like the world around you is just happening. There's no value judgments. There are uh, uh, patterns of cause and effect that are occurring and they simply unfold before you. And Brian Eno kind of really opened the gates with ambient music um, following that sort of train of thought. Uh, you And I think you hear a lot of his influence in later ambient music going for that approach it's not an approach that as much uh tangerine dream followed uh but i think even biosphere probably has some traces of that uh perspective of ambient music that you hear in brian you know uh it's a really excellent album in that regard to uh 
this may almost sound like a something not in its favor to listen to while you're doing something else. Uh, I think Brian Eno would be pleased with that because he uh, pretty much from what I've read intended for it to serve that purpose. Um, but, you know, if you're doing some kind of uh, tedious or repetitious work, it really serves to create a sort of meditative background to what you're doing. And I think that uh, he deserves a lot of credit for establishing that precedent in ambient music. Oh, huh. Yeah, um, I, I kind of concur with your initial statements that it shouldn't be up as high as like Tangerine Dream, um, because I, I don't view that Music Fair Reports has any longevity. You hear it once, you get the entire gist of what the album is. Whereas you look at Biosphere, each time you listen to it, you have to kind of reapproach it uh, in different ways, I would say, um, because it is very profound soundscapes and how it unfurls within itself is, you know, demands your attention. Whereas music for airports, uh, definitely you, you get what you get with it. And, um, honestly, I have heard elevator music that's more complex. <laughs> um, but I, I, I understand it's just an arbitrary title about the transitory nature of reality, which a lot of ambient music focuses on, but, um, I, I'm not offended by it. And like you said, with the looping aspect, I do agree that, you know, Biosphere used, utilize the same technique. Um, but I would honestly put it between a, a B and a C. Um, I, I just view that there's no real replay value to it. Once, once you hear it, you've heard it, move on with your life. Um, that, that's my general thoughts on that. Shelly, go ahead. So, I'm probably a bit of a Brian Eno hipster here in that I think I prefer discrete music, which was like the first ambient, the first traverse into ambience that Brian Eno made before that he's sort of a, almost a progressive rock guy. Um, and I love one of my favorite hobbies, aside from putting plastic bags inside other plastic bags, is reading the Rate Your Music reviews on uh, discrete music because you see people get themselves tied up in knots over saying that absolutely nothing is happening whilst acknowledging that that is the absolute point of the album and trying to work themselves around to or reconcile themselves to what Brian Eno was, was doing. And I quite like what Tyler was expounding upon there in, in terms of him being very formative to a certain style of ambience that Biosphere definitely took influence from. Not so much Tangerine Dream. I think they were sort of the um, the parallel work in, in a little bit of a different direction to Brian Eno. What I love about music for airports is it is the entire point that nothing happens. Um, it was released at a time when literally flying was still quite a novelty for a lot of people. So late seventies, early eighties, like commercial flying was a thing by then, but it, it wasn't like not everyone you meet on the street would have gone on a commercial flight. And there was still this idea of like, well, is it dangerous? Is it, is it um, safe? Is it, it's a very sort of, frightening thing to do and the fact that this album is so calming so relaxing is it's almost sort of preparing you for death the fact that it achieves a state of utter stasis utter kind of um what's the word submission to this idea of your known inert existence is it alleviates your fear of this in the same way that you know oxygen masks that drop down when when there's a crash happening are supposed to calm you and kind of reconcile you to your own mortality and the 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 minimalism the deliberate attempt to make sure that nothing happens it feels like a preparation for death like uh, a, a ritual a ceremony with, that speaks of like passing over preparing for transition you're literally in the waiting room for a change in psychological state and I think once you grasp that, you understand the genius of Brian Eno here. Um, I could understand why listening to this album raw, you might just think, well, it it might as well just be elevator music. But A, he was kind of the first very prominent artist to express some of this, but also just very clever at making engaging music that does absolutely nothing. And I think that is quite an underrated trait. It's a little bit like, he's a little bit like the ambient version of Iljan in a way. In the Iljan, fucking nothing happens in his music, but you're transfixed by it. And that's what I love about it. Um, 
again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't maybe rank it as high as the biosphere of the Tangerine Dream, but I'd be very happy with a high B or an A to B for me. All right, I'll move that up to uh, between an A and a B. I think it evens up. Segovia, Tyler, go ahead. Where would you put it? Uh, S tier. S <laughs> tier <laughs> for me. Uh, um, I, I think we may not be friends after this episode because I might say some things that might upset you, but go ahead. That's okay. Um, so I've made multiple comments uh, in prior episodes about how when it comes to death metal, I really appreciate the artists that are just kind of a straightforward stream of melody that un unravels or unfurls across the course of a piece. Um, very little adornment, the uh, kind of trimmed all the fat, so to speak. And I think that like in some cases with some Baroque composers that I enjoy, like Arcangelo Corelli or uh, Pietro Locatelli, um, or even some to a certain extent, uh, oh, my volume is low. Hmm. That a little better? Um, yeah. Sorry. No, you're fine. Uh, yeah, like, Arch like Archangelo Corelli or Pietro Locatelli or even some classical composers um, like, uh, probably going to mis mispronounce his name here, uh, Haydn. Um, and Andre Segovia does a really excellent job of creating these really compelling uh, sort of mimetic uh, um, pieces. Well, he doesn't create them. He plays what other composers have uh have written for him sometimes for him sometimes he covers baroque pieces especially on this two disc set um but he's a he's a excellent musician a master of his craft and they you have these pieces where something simple just a few notes uh is expanded upon over a piece and doesn't uh just complement what has already been established but uh but uh grows upon it and you get something that uh, like I said, grows from just a few notes to a sort of full-fledged expression that then modifies itself uh, with material from contrasting voices. And it really kind of creates effect, an effect similar to like reading a really good work of liter literature where uh, every character sort of changes over the course of the story and that change influences the, uh, the journey from that point forward. Um, so it really appeals to my sense of just really enjoying listening to a pattern of melody and what that, what potentials that pattern of melody has for a uh, change across the course of music, uh, and Andre Segovia, especially sort of because of the limitations of his medium, just playing classical guitar. That's really all that happens in the music. There's no sense in which you also look at his music for instrumentation and orchestration, how effective use of this instrument is here or this texture is there. It's really just kind of a clear ringing of melody and what that melody does to change and evolve over the course of the piece. And that's why uh, it's one of my favorite listens. One of the things I return to most frequently, it kind of almost resets my brain sometimes when I can become too wrapped up from listening to other things to getting tired of an aesthetic or finding that a certain style sort of all blurs into one. I listen to Andre Segovia and it almost retrains me to just listen to melody itself. So that's why I would give it an S ranking. So um, my, my quibbles of classical guitar, it's not just limited to Segovia. Um, I, I view that in order for it to be profound, it has to be ambiguous because of the limitations of the instrument. Whereas with piano, you can do three, four voices at once and fully flush those out with counterpoint. With classical guitar, you're limited, you know, just to the, the fretboard and how many digits you can put on it. Um, so being the, the, the most profound aspect of classical guitar is ambiguity um i would put it as a firm b especially if we're comparing it to other things that have been ranked like the bruckner um that's full orchestra there's so much going on um with the expressiveness there are no ambiguities um and the that's just the sheer aspect of guitar um the instrument itself that is limiting 
uh, regardless of the art art that is put into it, which I would say Segovia is in the highest rung, it, it is a very limited um, medium for artistic expression because you have to be ambiguous with some aspects of it for it to get across. Um, and, and in that regard, um, I would put it, you know, definitely above average, but nowhere near the Bruckner. So I'd put it towards a B. Um, Shelly, your thoughts? Well, I think I'm going to sit somewhere in between you guys on this. So with the Bruckner, I mentioned that I do prefer solo, uh, solo or small um, ensemble sort of classical forms. Um, but to some extent, I do agree with you, Jason, in that the piano, or at least the classical grand piano, is a much more expressive instrument, and that does resonate with me slightly more. But there is something to be said for a, you know, a harpsichord suite or a solo piece for cello or violin, and I kind of view that in this in the same light. In that, I really like Tyler's char characterization of it, resetting your brain. Because um, when I was listening to this, and I am I am familiar with some of these pieces obviously they're very very famous well well-known pieces but classical guitar isn't sort of my go-to when it comes to listening to solo classical pieces so I, I do quite like being reminded to listen to it now and then because it really is music in its purest form as as tyler kind of explained there like just th this one instrument doesn't really have sustain um so it kind of has to act as its own ambience its own percussion melody harmony bass whatever and the ways that composers and players have come up with to kind of uh compensate for that in the you know with a big old grand piano you you push the sustain pedal down and whack some chords down and you've got your ambience there and you can you can almost create a facsimile of an orchestra from that whereas this there is nowhere to hide it's kind of like my discussion around the production of blessed of the sick and that it's very immediate and clear and sterile and clinical there is nowhere to hide and the idea that a composer has to work within that format it creates new like dimensions of of creativity and and how they go about enriching the sound results in like a complex vocabulary where like a single melodic line will collide against an intricate complex of chords and and arpeggios and so on and i really like engaging with that i can have enough of it because i am a guy that loves his timbres i love various textures and so on i i do like depth and dearth to um what i'm listening to but i really like yeah as tyler said i think that's the perfect characterization of it. it's like resetting yourself by listening to something like this it was almost like listening to at the gates the red and the sky is ours in this just pure expression through nothing else just this raw melodic stream coming out uh so yeah, I, I I put it between an S and an A for me. I think. All right, I believe that puts it as a an A. I'll be nice and say it's just an A. But again, um, maybe you guys will realize that when you're older and after more years of listening to music, that guitar-based music has its limitations, unfortunately. Um, especially, you know, extreme metal and extreme metal tries to get around that, you know, by adding, you know, other elements. Um, but uh, craft work, me and machine, a robot machine, uh, boing, boom, chat, boing. I've not heard of these guys. Boing, boom, chat. Go ahead, Tyler. Where would you put it? S tier. <laughs> S tier. All right. Um, so, yeah, much for similar in some ways, similar reasons to uh, Andre Segovia or to a lot of my favorite classical. Um, really what you have, and I've explained this to people before when talking about classical music, you know, we talk about um, complexity, right? And to most people, complexity means something like very difficult to understand or very difficult to play. And so uh, a lot of people also who feel that way kind of just as a sort of um, how do I want to put this sort of just saying like, well, of course, classical music is the most complex music ever. And, but, you know, tying that in with their idea of complexity being difficult to understand or difficult to play, uh, you know, I've, uh, s said to these people before, well, you know, when you're listening to, um, some of the greatest of classical music, 
like I'll use an example that maybe uh, everybody here likes like Beethoven. You'd be surprised that while I do think it is very complex, the most, some of the most complex music ever created in human history, um, that it has a lot of profundity and depth to it. The melodies themselves, especially when they are just introduced, are oftentimes on your definitions of complexity, which may mean a lot of notes, really complex chords, things played really quickly or in several different time signatures, uh, don't really have any of that. They can oftentimes be incredibly simple, memorable too, but incredibly simple. And where the profundity arises is how that simple and memorable melody develops. Um, it's almost like seeing, it's kind of a tired analogy, but it's almost like witnessing the development of something in a natural landscape, right? Something like a tree or even a leaf in and of itself is a seemingly simple mechanism. But the way that it plays into the overall whole of the organism or even at a larger scope, the ecosystem, uh, over, and especially even over the course of time, there's a lot of complex patterns that can emerge from that. And I think that's where you see the profundity or, so to speak, the complexity in classical music. And Kraftwerk, to me, does something very similar. Uh, they have very simple, memorable melodies that they then develop, sometimes through an ambient technique of like a looping pattern that adds layers, sometimes through actual pattern development, like what you see in progressive rock um, or in heavy metal, for instance, uh, echoing the theme of this uh, particular episode of metal adjacent music or in classical music. You can also tell that they, that the uh, members of Kraftwerk are conversant with classical music. Um, some of their melodies, uh, like uh, the example I'll use is from another record uh, from Trans Europe Express, the opening to the song, to the, uh, to the first track, Europe Endless, quite clearly shows that they're conversant with classical music and how melodies op typically operate within classical music. Um, but uh, Kraftwerk are able to take those simple ideas and by developing them, reveal the nuance in some of those ideas and create a profound statement through them. So like on this record, for instance, uh, they really are able to take the simple idea of the joy and excitement of the new frontier of technology and expand upon it to reveal some of the conflict that arises from that. Technology is exciting, it's a new frontier, but it also has some aspects that isolate us, that kind of um, di divorce us from the world around us to a certain extent. Um, you can see that even in realms of lyrical subject matter, like on the song, uh, The Robots, you know, you have the almost amusingly um, simple course of we are the robots. Um, and it sounds like they're just kind of making a funny statement of like, hey, aren't robots cool? And I think that uh, childlike uh, wonder is definitely part of the the intended message. But there's also almost a sense, especially with some of the darkness that comes through in some of the melodies as they develop and layer throughout the piece of as if they're asking a question, you know, um, or not even asking a question, but saying, no, it's not just that we're talking about actual robots. Maybe we people have become something more akin to robots. Uh, I think Kraftwerk are geniuses at being able to reveal that ambiguity within a modern landscape. And I think that on a musical level, they have uh, very effective tools for doing so. Definitely one of my uh, favorite listens, something that almost can be akin to listening to black metal for me at times. And some <laughs> black metal artists have listed these guys as an influence. So to me, that makes at least a little bit of sense. So yeah, S tier ranking album for me. Wow. Um, that was a mouthful. Um, thank you, Tyler. Um, that was very in-depth into the aesthetic of craft work. Um, also to note is they are the first techno band ever to exist. Um, the four guys just pecking away on keyboards. One guy's playing virtual drums. Another guy is playing a simple melody and another guy with a chord and all of that. And then, of course, a guy uh, doing vocals. I like Kraftwerk quite a bit. Um, I have been acquainted with their music since I was 18. My friend Daniel um, Valdez, who was on this podcast one time, introduced me to them. And uh, as well as Larry from Acerbus, um, he was really into Kraftwerk. And something like funny anecdote, um, 
the guys from the California band Discords were in town, and uh, I guess they're they're high on the marijuana. And Larry put on the craft work, and one of the guys from Discords like freaked the fuck out. It was just like it was scary music to him personally, as he was stoned. But um, uh, craft work, I, I view uh, some of my favorite songs are not on this specific album um like computer love and all that and radioactivity um as well as the boing boom shot ping and all that and uh the the meme worthy music um craft work i wouldn't share say it shares a a connection with classical music um at all um yes it it does have an ensemble and they are playing, you know, different things on their respective keyboards, but it's all very simplistic. It's straight and matter of fact. Um, I, I would honestly rate it as an A, Tyler, um, not an S. Um, I do love uh, Craftwork quite a bit, but I do not view it as profoundly as you do. Go ahead, Shelley. Well, I, I think some classical composers come across as simpletons compared to craft work because they they have no conception of the manip manipulation of timbre that craft work would have done like they work in either solo forms like piano or violin or cello or string quartet or a, or a symphony orchestra but that pales in comparison to the sheer breadth of um nuance that a band like craft work in the post-industrial age we're able to to work with that being said these are this is one of those bands that i'm aware of their influence like listening to this album is like listening to the whole of the first half of the 80s pop music kind of come to life and they again they have that mass appeal they obviously very much appeal to metalheads but they appeal to fans of pop ambient electronic uh, and the and lgbt so community i've heard like craftwork shows it's like a big rally for the LGBT community as well. Um, well, yeah, I mean, uh, electronic or industrial is very kind of affiliated with um, with that kind of club scene as well. Again, in the early early eighties, um, synth pop was was very important for a lot of kind of um, communities. Um, yeah, for a lot of sort of yeah, gay gay clubbing and so on. Um, but there's also an element of like you can hear. I mean, you, you again. You mentioned um, I can't remember which one it was. But one of the minimalist composers earlier on, Philip Glass, Steve Rock, or someone. Yeah, you. you well, not necessarily other part because he was more of a. He's more interested in minimalism as a sort of source of spiritualism, but more of the American composers that used shifting arpeggios and so on. You you can hear that play out in in craft work as well, and it, they're really effective at kind of in a similar way to later Tangerine Dream, sort of developing these very, very basic arpeggios and then using one single uh, harmony to drive the, the piece forward. For me personally, I do, if we're talking about Berlin bands, I sort of sit on the Tangerine Dream side to the Kraftwerk side because Kraftwerk is slightly too close to pop music for me. Uh, although I do really kind of, they're one of these bands that I'm told to like constantly and I'm told of the significance of, and I acknowledge it because I, I, I get it. I get it intellectually, but in my heart, I'm just like, I can, I can appreciate it, but it's not, it's not for me. I just don't, it doesn't quite sit right with me. So <laughs> it's going to, it's going to have to be a B I think for me. Oh, wow. I, I mean, I was thinking around a B for me too, um, but I, I, I like the novelty and, I understand the, the criticism about how close it is to pop music because essentially it is pop music. You look well, at I'm also aware that what I'm saying basically right now is blasphemy. I might as well be, uh, I don't I know. I mean, you could consider it blasphemy, but the band themselves refer to the music as pop music. But I mean, in also another... me just not, not necessarily, I, I like a lot of pop music and I'm not ashamed to say that. It's more just me saying that I don't, it doesn't really resonate with me. They're one of these bands where, like I said, intellectually, I really get the significance of these guys. But I don't have that um, affiliation with them on a on a sort of more spiritual level as I would a Tangerine Dream, for instance. Right, which I totally understand. I love both artists um, for some some similar reasons and some different reasons. But yeah, I can understand them. You know, they definitely 
they impacted a lot of uh, 80s pop music. And so when you listen to them, inevitably you're going to uh, be reminded of it. There's going to be some comparisons drawn. Um, so I can totally understand, you know, just if you're off put by that aesthetic, then you're going to get some of that in craft work. Well, that's that's the thing. I'm not off put by that aesthetic. Like I get the idea of like them being victims of their own legacy in a lot of ways in like, a you know, an old film or whatever. But I actually, you know, I'm a big fan of like, Depeche Mode, Gary Newman, Ultravox. Like, I really like a lot of that music. But, um, yeah, for me, the yeah, the craftwork thing is like, it, it's one of these things. It's like, yeah, it's just, I understand the significance, and I'm not trying to do that down. And I'm not, I mean, yeah, call me a philistine. It's just, it's not, <laughs> you're not quite there for me. Yeah, but. that's not. That's well, honestly, not like, call you. yeah. Um, I listen to, you know, some pop music. You know, I view Ramstein as Madonna and uh, I, I view them as completely equal because they go for the same goal and Kraftwerk, I would say, you know, goes for the same goal as well. Ramstein covered them. And well, no, I'd say Kraftwerk is slightly more sophisticated than Madonna. Like, let's let's be real about this. But I mean, yeah. I mean, and if you're talking about uh, like it being like a badge of uh, like dishonor to be called pop music. I mean, from a classical perspective, uh, death metal is pop music. <laughs> you know, it's popular music, so to speak. Um, you know, it's not like academic. Or, I, I, uh, I I've like heard criticism that. about death metal and black metal from uh, actually you know classically inclined people, you know, college professors and all that, and their interpretation of extreme metal is like corn. And things like that, they they haven't really dug that far into it. And granted, there there are some aspects of music that just this very off putting for them, um, the harsh textures and all of that. So, and you know some of the lyrical content. Um, so that's why they kind of stray away from it. So there's a lot of those, you know, uh, academia type types. They they just don't get that far into extreme metal, but just because the uh, the aesthetics of it. Um, whereas I, I love that fucking harsh aesthetic. Um, so talking of harsh aesthetic, yep, we've watched Mesbo in for Japanese C. noise, Japanese. Noise. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I don't like noise. Um, that's why I put it in a C. I understand there, there is some artistic merit to it. Um, but yeah, a strong C for me. How about you, Shelley? I think I'd agree with a C. I do really like this album. I've I've owned it for many, many years. Um, I kind of treat it again as like a four part ambient album. Um, in that once you get over the initial shock of static that's coming at you, you can sort of treat it more as like an exploration of timbre and texture and intensity, in that it he kind of drives each piece through various kind of waves of uh, dynamics and volume and um, subtle but very much present sort of percussive elements as well but uh, noise is one of these genres that feels much more like a I know it's been around for a long time and Merzbo has been going for decades now but it feels like a meme genre for anime fans to kind of uh, signal to each other that they're into something wacky and weird without really discussing any sophistication because 90% of it doesn't have any. Merz Bo sounds as part from that because he is a very sophisticated, long-standing, well-established artist. And I think this is actually a great album. I wouldn't rank it much higher than a C, but I think in terms of noise, it is a bit of a novelty genre, a bit like grindcore or something. And then it's just a way for people to sort of be a little bit lol random about their personalities and so on. It's more like a personality adornment than it is a uh, sophisticated form of music. So I don't feel right talking about this in the same way that we've been discussing some of these other albums here. So I think, yeah, C is probably fair. I think we should have brought in author and Punisher so we could have something rated lowly. I, I heard a couple of songs by them that I liked, and then I checked out their discography. I was hanging out with uh, Joseph April and Daniel Lake and, I guess Joseph April had played some author and Punisher, which they have a lot of noise aspects, the harsh textures and all that. And it sounded really cool. Um, but then I actually went into the discography 
And there, there's nothing there. There's no like intuitive aspect of like musicality or anything like that. And I would place it, you know, even below the Japanese noise. But all right, uh, Tyler, go ahead. Yeah, I was somewhat taken aback by this album because uh, I had never listened to Mertzbo before. I might have listened to them during my whole experimental music phase as a teenager, but I don't remember it because I listened to a lot of stuff back then. Um, but I the groups that I see Mertzbo mentioned in frequently, for some reason, and I'm not sure if in comparison to their discography, if this is way off, I always thought they would sound more like post rock that's just kind of where i categorize them in my head for some reason because it always seemed to be people who it was liked... postmodern as shit <laughs> like right epitome of postmodernism yeah there's it would always seemed to be those groups of people who had mentioned mertzbo so that's kind of what i assumed they sounded like so then i turned this on and it reminded me of an artist i actually like especially their earlier works um, it, it reminded me of KK Knoll, another Japanese noise artist. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, I was taken aback by that. Uh, that being said, um, I noise is a difficult genre to do well in. Uh, as Shelley said, the problem with noise is that it's a novelty. And when you're writing something that within a genre that's a novelty you're struggling against is there actual substance to your music or are you just contributing to the novelty and that can be really difficult to overcome even if you do have actual substance to what you're trying to communicate in your music i feel like kk Knoll accomplishes that on some of his albums like ultimate material three for <laughs> example um but it's a really it's a really difficult obstacle to surmount um, I would have to listen to this record several more times before I was able to determine uh, if it um, if it accomplished the being something within noise that actually um, had something to say, or if I felt like it leaned more towards uh, sort of just being another example, although maybe a better one, a better put together one of this is something interesting to do that's not really done in music very often. Uh, so I would definitely put this around a C, I think. Oh, well. Yeah, I think in the canon of noise, it is considered like the, you know, Led Zeppelin four or whatever. Like it is like a classic of the genre and Merzbo is a classic of the genre. But uh, I, I think that kind of speaks to noise as like more of a catalyst or an influence, an influential genre rather than, a thing in its own right a little bit like again i alluded to grindcore earlier and that pure grindcore is very hard to do creatively but when it influences other genres like an impaled nazarene or whatever in black metal it is really really effective in the same way that noise can be on ambient or industrial and black metal as well right yeah you see a similar effect with hardcore to be honest uh they yeah they yeah yeah noise hardcore grindcore a lot of those punk influenced genres i think that the largest contribution they made to music was the idea of you can reduce aesthetic tra trappings you can strip them down and get back to thinking of music as what is the melody doing you know on a very simple level and then it seems like a lot of the times better artists take up that idea and then utilize it in a different way than those genres did and make something profound out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually feel good now. I was quite hungover when we started this episode, but thankfully I've had some birthday beers. Um, Shelly, do you like Schultz's uh, ambient music? I feel it's very spotty. Do you feel spotty? So, Time Wind is possibly the best ambient album ever made. Um, it encapsulates everything that Tangerine Dream promised and to some extent achieved, but Schools was able to articulate in a way that I have never heard done before. And again, it's these really simple clusters of arpeggios that are accompanied by very simple harmonic material but each time the the lead note 
anticipates the arpeggio and everything kind of takes a few bars to catch up and just he builds and builds and builds on these really basic layers um until sort of you know half an hour has passed and you're not even aware of time passing it's very hypnotic very um trance like just captivating music his other albums around that period so time when was released 1975 his other albums around that period uh take a totally different approach and to that extent i admire him as an artist for just not sitting on a style and kind of just doing that his other albums are very drone like they they toy with sound art to some extent as early tangerine dream did as well this what we're discussing here is his debut as a solo artist and that is very much a drone album in that it is single clusters of normally notes played on an organ and as a chord develops he will sometimes overlap to a point of dissonance and he'll let the dissonance hang for a few bars and that can be really effective but it, it does it feels a little bit um like he's anticipating a slightly more um sophisticated form of composition i would still say this is a really like a solid example of early 70s like berlin school ambient i think it's really really good but if i'm as i am with all of his albums comparing it to time wind it does fall short I think B is maybe a little bit fair. I think I put it between an A and a B for me. Yeah, there's a, a song by Klaus Schulz, uh, Continuum, off the album Continuum, the, the first track, Sequencer. I fucking love that track so much. Um, I feel that that is like pure mastery over the art form of ambient music. Um, how about you, Tyler? Damn, I did it again. All right, so... Uh, so Schultz, uh, I kind of have, uh, sort of mixed feelings about, I enjoy listening to his music from time to time. It's uh, very good. Um, I guess that if I have a problem with it, it's that it's not quite, um, nerdy enough in the way that I typically like music where I can, uh, like with like Tangerine Dreams, uh, I've heard um, Continuum, Tyler, I have heard I have heard continuous. You don't think that's nerdy enough? That's fucking nerdy as hell. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. It's good. I do like uh, Schultz. It's just like with Rubicon or Phaedra, they have, it really appeals to that side of me that likes to hear pattern development in music. Klaus Schultz uh, sometimes leans a little bit more into the camp where there will be really cool themes that I think sound really neat. Um, but, you know, they'll be separated by more developments along textural lines or lines of timber, which just doesn't appeal to me as much. I'm not as much that kind of a listener when it comes to music. So music that makes a lot of experimentation in that regard, it uh, I'll sometimes find it interesting, but it won't be something that I consider uh, in, in like my personal taste, like one of the best of the best. And so because of that, I'll, when it comes to this style of ambient music tend more towards tangerine dream because with it's like a uh, sequencer loops and things, and then slowly developing those, those over the course of a piece uh, that really appeals to that nerdy side of me that likes to hear the pattern and melody, like what directions does it move in and what specific shape and how does that shape sort of emerge into different shapes and then decay into other ones that really appeals to me on those records i feel like you don't quite get as much of that on schultz uh he does it he does what he does very very well and like i said he does have really cool themes sometimes themes that are so awesome that other artists that i would say i like better i kind of wish they would make use of those style of themes from time to time uh but it's not really as much my cup of tea and that particular brand of music. So I would probably put it as a B. All right. And it stays in a B. Um, and if you're watching and listening, uh, we are on the Raphael albums. Unfortunately, he was unable to join today, but we're going to honor his presence regardless. So we're going to still rank his albums. I know Telly, Shelly has some uh, notes written because he did check them out. Um, so for the next one, I did not listen to that. I apologize. I did not do my homework. It's it's a. Uh, I did download the cover for the tier list, but I did not. 
Um, Shelly, um, can you introduce this one? Because I, I don't even know what, <laughs> what it is. <laughs> so I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, but I think this is a band called Hedninga, and the album's called Tra. Um, and they're a sort of neo-folk collective, a Swedish neo-folk collective. This album was released in 1994. Uh, in terms of ranking, I'd say it's about C. Um, what I like about this album, and in some ways it, it kind of it echoes aspects of the world music of Dead Can Dance, but because it was released in 1994... It's very much a product of post dance, post rave culture in that it combines like trad folk. And it's very chimerical in that sense. It's got elements of sort of gypsy music, elements of Nordic folk. You can hear like Norwegian fiddle music going on. You can hear Celtic music as well, but you can also hear pounding kind of rave instrumentation going on. And to that extent, it's a little bit too chimerical for me. It's a little bit too much of a Frankenstein's monster. But I really like the audacity of it. It combines sort of Euro pop with Dead Can Dance in a way that is outrageously catchy, um, but also a little bit silly at times. Um, so one can't help sort of get carried away with it, but also uh, not to take it as seriously as some of the other albums that we're discussing here. So I think uh, a solid C for me. All right, Tyler. Yeah, I agree with Shelly on this one. In a way, the silliness of it and the catchiness of it uh, kind of um, harken back to what could be thought of as uh, some of the original purposes of folk music, right? Um, you know, it was meant to be something very organic and dirty in a sense that it wasn't just trying to be something serious or... Uh, something great it was just meant to kind of reflect uh the daily experiences of regular people uh, yeah know, and to that to that extent as well i really like the uh blending of different folk styles because again that would have been an aspect of folk when you get sort of wandering bands of musicians that pick up different elements from different regions or different uh parts of the continent or whatever and they just combine it into this chimera and that's another feature of folk and that they're very informal kind of way of musical influence and you do get that sense on this album as well which i really liked exactly so in some ways uh when it comes to neo folk uh bands like this that are not as serious as the more grave examples of neo folk like death in june for example uh kind of harken back to some aspects of uh, authentic folk music that the more serious bands don't. Um, not saying that the more serious bands don't also have some aspects of authentic folk music that maybe bands like this group don't. Uh, but um, that being said, that those same aspects are part of what makes the genre very limited um, in uh, enjoyment for me because uh, once you get the sort of um, flavor, so to speak, of the folk style of melody, which I do prefer to more of the mass produced pop melodies that came out later on in history through rock music and pop music. Um, there's not too much more beyond that. Some folk music kind of goes into some sense of development or narrative, uh, but overall the sort of informal nature of the art form makes it to where it never really achieves a cohesive sense of structure um and so that's exactly why like dead can dance for instance that i mentioned this with them i feel like they actually have some superiority to some even authentic folk music because they had the benefit of being later in time and approaching some of those styles with a more uh, structured um, approach. So, um, yeah, because of that, I would put this album around a C personally. And a C, it shall be B E, not just the the tier B. All right, uh, Shelly, did you listen to this one um, from Raphael, the Beyond soundtrack? Yeah. Uh, so, Raphael was sort of uh, really pushing the soundtrack uh, element of the sort of metal adjacent stuff. And to some extent, that's really understandable in that like a lot of the um, Norwegian black metal guys 
said like they they were listening to a lot of soundtracks at the time as well as sort of listening to you know Bathory and Dead Can Dance and classic metal they were heavily influenced by horror film scores as well not just hammer horror but also um more uh contemporary i guess to them horror films and some of the sort of more abstract italian films as well and the beyond was released in the early 80s it's not a film that i've seen but i listened to the soundtrack in preparation for this um and the thing that really struck me about this is although the film was made in the early 80s it is very much like of the 70s and that it's this concoction of like psychedelic rock elements of funk and jazz, but it it manages to work these quite bright musical genres into creepy avant-garde kind of versions of themselves by using early synthesizers, but also a very sort of abstract approach to. I, I think he might have chosen this as like a mouthpiece to uh, for like horror movie soundtracks i know he chose this yeah but i i think like uh you look at phantasm which has the entombed melody in it um this might have been a mouthpiece for him just like how you know like, like you're saying a lot of the metalheads liked you know horror movies and all that and soundtracks um and how much it influenced. i i'm sorry i've had a few beers no no that's fine there's there's pieces that like no you say that there's pieces on here that are just like um single piano lines but they sound like uh, prison era Burzum ambient, for example, and you can you can almost hear the crossover here. Like, but also the soundtrack is sort of embroiled in that sense of like seventies ridiculousness. But you can hear the elements that were lifted by later black metal artists, um, both the abstract, but also this is sort of a, an occult film. Um, it's it's about a hotel that's sort of built on a on a gateway to hell. And you can hear those elements of realism mixed with occult themes and fantastical themes, elements of folk and industrial kind of lifted from this as well. The idea of abstract expression mixing with more traditional kind of romantic themes as well, which metal sits on the fault lines of alongside a little bit of neoclassical flair. Um, so yeah, I, I can definitely see why Raphael picked this. It's, it's, it's a very sort of compelling, uh, set of uh tracks but you're right jason it's kind of it is a mouthpiece for the wider cross contamination of horror film scores with yeah with early extreme metal in the in the mid 80s uh sorry in terms of ranking though <laughs> again proximity breeds love so for me i'm gonna rank this as a c because i only heard it the first time the other day and i don't really have much strong affiliation with it so all right uh tyler any thoughts on the beyond soundtrack yeah there are, are horror movie soundtracks that have more uh distinguished uh themes that i enjoy more like the goblin coming up next for instance or i am guilty of listening to uh john carpenter's uh soundtracks from time to time as well as his solo music which is actually pretty good for its style uh this one is definitely a product of its time, as Shelley alluded to. You hear some funk and jazz influence coming through, some progressive rock and rock in general. Um, but it is a really interesting uh, mouthpiece, as both of you said, for discussing the influence of horror movie soundtracks on metal in general, which is something that extends all the way to the beginning of heavy metal from Black Sabbath forward. And... Uh, it's something that some people sometimes think is overstated. Like how many metal artists were actually listening regularly to horror movie soundtracks um, or how many of them are horror movie buffs. Most, most modern day metal fans that are horror movie buffs are more into like gore grind and slam death metal and brutal death metal. Um, but out of like what are considered the classics, the, the top tier albums in metal how many of them were regularly watching horror movies let alone listening to soundtracks and i think that the influence of horror movie soundtracks like this one on heavy metal is more kind of through osmosis a lot of they were part of the culture and you were playing a style of music that focused on darker themes so you were aware 
of horror movies and you were aware of the general kind of music they played, the kind of shape of melodies that were used in horror movie soundtracks to create a sense, uh, to create a feeling of suspense or a feeling of terror or conflict. And that would sort of subconsciously influence of, Oh, I want this part in my music to sound suspenseful or to sound terrifying or to sound like you're being attacked. And so that's where the influence came through in my opinion. So I don't think that people saying that the influence of horror movies is overstated are right. I just don't think they understand exactly how horror movie soundtracks influenced heavy metal. Uh, that being said, this one, I don't um, appreciate as much just listening to it as a piece of music as I do the Suspiria soundtrack or um, some of John Carpenter's soundtracks like to the thing. Um, uh, so I would probably rank it lower than those albums. So a C fits about perfectly for me. Okie doke. Um, all right. Yeah, the Beyond soundtrack fell, fell within the C territory. Sorry, Raphael, if you're listening. Um, uh, you may be more familiarized with it than we are. Um, I, I have heard the, uh, the Goblin Suspiria album. I actually played a festival with them, and that was when Attila from Mayhem was at my merch table hanging out with me, and uh, Goblin was on stage. You know, they're, they they showed the movie Suspiria, and Goblin played it live. Um, I will say uh, I do like it, and there is a song off of Yersinia Pestis, I'm unsure if you guys can pinpoint which one. I think it was Weeping Boobos, um, where I, I jacked up the melody, the la 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 la, to like a thousand and played it super fast and added more notes and has this like really uh, grandiose type of statement. It's later in the album where I'm going super fast on piano. Um, that was actually inspired by uh, the Suspiria melody. Um, I would rate it as a, a strong. Uh, B, um, very uh, forward looking band, you know, in terms of scoring music, um, off kilter from left field. Um, but compared to some of the other music that we've already tiered, um, yeah, I think it's above average, but not a timeless classic. How about you, Shelly? Yeah, I, I think a B, I definitely rate it above the beyond soundtrack and as far as like the canon of classic horror scores there are things that i would probably have picked over these i think tyler already discussed that although i had to step out for a second um to do god's work um there are other horror films that i would have picked over these two but i know that suspiria is is like a classic in that and listening back to the soundtrack you can kind of see why it is both the most varied but also the most cohesive as an independent piece of music separate from the visual artistry that it's affiliated with you you again you get elements of that 70s weirdness you get elements of sound art you get elements of the um aggressive ambient of tangerine dream you get elements of psych uh, all blended into a very cohesive and unified piece of work. Uh, so I, I could definitely see why Raphael would have picked this, but it's not my favorite if we're just talking about the art of scoring a horror film alone. I mean, even something like the Alien soundtrack is up there for me in terms of, but that again speaks to more my fan of my being a fan of dark ambience as an exercise in the exploration of texture itself as an expressive tool and not just melody, whereas Goblin are going for something very different here. But yeah, I think between a B and a C would probably be a fair ranking as far as I'm concerned. All right, Tyler, what are your thoughts? Suspiria. I mean, I'm fond of this soundtrack. Uh, I'm also fond of the film, uh, excellent horror film from its time. I had uh, it I had it on a DVD and... I went through a phase where I was like, I'm not a materialist. So I donated all my DVDs, everything to the library. <laughs> and they uh, sold it all. Um, I had a whole bunch of crazy horror movies and just went through the, the non-materialist phase. That's <laughs> unfortunate. This would have been one of the ones I would recommend you keep. 
Um, no, I, I got rid of them all. So it's a it's a pretty good movie, you know. Um, it's a, there's that line from it that's been sampled in metal so many times it's ridiculous. The hell waits behind that door line, um, <laughs> but uh, Infester sampled it as one example. Yeah, they did. Uh, yeah. Yep. Um, but um, yeah, the Goblin is, you know, got its pitfalls, and its pitfalls kind of come from being. Well, at least on this record, because I'm not familiar with their entire discography by far. I've listened to their soundtracks almost exclusively, Suspiria, Phenomena, things like that. Um, But it's got its downfalls from being a soundtrack in that there's not going to be much of a narrative development because you're forming the music around what's happening in the film. Um, But that being said, they are very talented at creating um, a sort of unnerving sense of melody. The uh, main theme of the soundtrack is a great example of that. Very memorable, very creepy. Um, and even in like the extended version of the main theme, they almost get to the level of having a similar sense of song development as like a merciful fate <laughs> almost. Um, but um, yeah, that being said, I do like it a lot more than some other soundtracks of horror films from that time or a little later that I've listened to because of its inventiveness, uh, because of its really uh, strong sense of theme, um, which in later in more modern horror films, you almost don't get at all. You get the the air horn sound. And uh, like like I said, with Hans Zimmer uh, pads, pads and more pads. Um, But, uh, and I really appreciate the, this time in horror films where there was really distinguishable um, theme with the music. So because of that, I would also put it at about a B, especially in considering ranking it with, along with the other albums on this list. All right. Um, Shelly, I I think you may be more familiarized with Coil than I am. Um, I I have a passing uh, listenership with Coil, nothing like really in depth. Um, I understand, you know, very experimental, one of the forerunners for like the industrial type of sound, uh, things of that nature. Shelly, uh, where would you put this? Uh, ooh, I don't rate Coil, uh, or at least I don't rate this album. So I know a lot of people that I, I respect very much that uh, consider Coil to be like the seminal post-industrial modernist ambient kind of <laughs> A lot of goths love fucking coil. Uh, yeah, I yeah. I was thinking you're the yeah. goth guy. I am the goth guy, but also, and again, I was talking to Tyler before we started recording. Is uh, there's elements of this album that I really love. Um, tracks like, I mean, it's got a really long name. I've written it down. Uh, Red birds will out of the east destroy Paris at night. Uh, that's like a worthy su- successor to Tangerine Dream style that I was talking about earlier on. But then there are elements where they do a really, really effective job of creating moody, dark ambient, but they ruin it with spoken word poetry. And I don't like spoken word poetry over most forms of music, especially when it's done in the posh southern accent that uh, they do. Much like my accent, actually. They do it in my accent, but I really don't like that style and it really puts me off on a metal track when they do whispered or spoken word stuff as well. Well, Shirley, really... Shirley, can I tell you something? Go ahead. Man to man. Yeah. I haven't yeah. watched Harry Potter. Okay. Well, Harry Potter's a book, so I'm, I'm fine with you not having watched it. But uh, I haven't watched it. Okay. That's that's fine, Jason. I that's the posh you. accent, right? I mean, yeah, Harry Potter is famous for uh, glorifying British boarding schools, which are essentially factories of child abuse. But um, Harry Potter is famous for <laughs> glorifying that particular arm of of English culture. But I don't want to go down. I don't want to go down that route. I was more talking about the the fact that Coil are really effective in creating the this sort of alienating uh, world of. Um, Again, we come back to this word modernist uh, solitude, where they create a very urban kind of sound of concrete and plastic and so on. And 
there are moments of beauty as with the aforementioned track and there are moments where they indulge in and in sort of jazz aspects as well again speaking to this urbanist you almost feel like you're walking through central london in listening to this album but it is ruined by by the spoken word stuff i don't think musicians should try and be poets i think lyrics are not poetry uh lyrics are not prose um if you're going to create this style it is best left instrumental or at least left with maybe one or two words now and then if you think that that adds texture but for this it just it really takes me out of the moment and really kind of kills the vibe that coil were going for here so for me yeah again i place it around the c but i know that coil are held in such high regard by a lot of people that i very much respect that that's probably going to be considered again blasphemy but like i said was, at the start was, of the was episode, rice really like the the forerunner of industrial uh no boyd rice was not the forerunner to anything he's a sort of uh What's the word? After for for industrial. Uh Throbbing oh. Gristle is where you, Throbbing Gristle is where you want to start with industrial. Yeah, he was involved with Throbbing Gristle, right? Like they were his friends at least. Uh maybe so, but I don't I don't know how much of an influence he would have had on the early direction of uh Throbbing Gristle, but all right. Uh Tyler, your thoughts on the coil? Uh sure, but first, uh Shelly, can I tell you something? Go ahead. Man to man. <laughs> Look what I started. I have watched with Nail and I. Oh, well that's that's one of my favorite films. <laughs> I just wanted to let you know that. All right. So anyhow, I was pleasantly surprised by this album to an extent. Um, because I always thought of Coil kind of like with Mertzbo, although a different genre. I thought they were something of a an industrial act, of a post industrial act. And I turn this on and I get kind of dreamy nighttime ambient soundscapes. And it's not what I was expecting. Uh, and in that regard, I liked it. It was good in the sense of being a enjoyable nighttime journey uh, as, you know, as a term I've used for metal records on our last episode. But I did have some problems with it it doesn't really develop to anything that would put it in the ranks of what I would consider a profound ambient album. Um, and also there were some aesthetic aspects that were annoying, the exact same ones that, um, that Shelley mentioned. Um, the spoken word is jarring kind of takes your, takes you out of the headspace that the music is trying to put you into. It works against the music and you don't want to put anything onto your recording that works against what you're trying to do. Um, I guess unless you're really wanting to create a feeling of uh, grinding conflict of things being jarring and pulling themselves apart. But I don't think that was the intention behind this album, given how uh, sort of meditative and sparse and vast the more instrumental portion of it is. Uh, some of the jazz flourishes felt a little bit out of place i but i feel that way when i hear them on almost any ambient record and so uh, for some of them depending on how good i think they are overall i'll just choose to ignore them um but this record it was nice for what it was trying to do i don't think i would come back to it even in a sense of lesser ambient records that i listen to somewhat regularly because there's better options in my in my humble opinion that's not me saying that, like Shelley, I don't respect the place that these that this group has within the history of industrial music. And that's not to say that I'm also not giving them props for so successfully um, pulling off an album in this style. So, yeah, I would give this album a C. All right. Um, that's today's word B. Gentlemen, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Uh, one thing is, I know that a lot of people have um, engaged with the comments, uh, sorry, with my request for like uh, submissions and stuff. And I really do thank you for for commenting on that and for all your submissions. Obviously, time is limited, so we couldn't cover all of them. We've tried to incorporate some of them here and all of your other submissions. Um, there are either things that I already hold in very high regard or um, they're things that I definitely will be visiting. So, yeah, thank you very much for engaging with that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you at least find some 
affiliation with the list that we've concocted here. So yeah, thank you very much. All right. Very good. Very good. Yes, you definitely have to address the audience because they're the reason why we're here. Tyler, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think that it's important to remember that when we're doing these lists, as Jason has said before, it's not supposed to be a definitive statement as to what is the best or the worst music. It's supposed to be a stimulant for discussion about the albums themselves more than anything else, so that we have an opportunity to discuss various albums that may not be talked as much in the sphere of metal and metal adjacent music and talk about what makes albums work and not just in an objective sense of overall quality for everyone but more so in relation to some of the personalities on the podcast we all have varying tastes that while different from each other we respect uh our variances in taste because we realize that means that person's familiar with aspects of music that we're not as familiar with and talking about these albums that we can all generally agree have some level of greatness to them or something interesting about them allows us to get several different outlooks on why these albums are good or what these albums do. Um, that being said, for this particular list, I don't really have any complaints about it at all. I think it turned out about exactly as I would have wanted it to. So, yeah, that's about but it. But also, our tier lists are absolutely definitive, and if you disagree, then you're completely wrong. I forgot that we had that re- we had that caveat at the beginning <laughs> of this episode. My apology. I mean, we're, we're judging metal adjacent music. Of course, we're 100% right. We are as entrenched in metal than anyone else, and we understand a lot of music outside of metal. Therefore, yeah, this is the definitive list. Um, not Franz list, but the list. <laughs> My birthday. And uh, thank you so much for listening, liking, subscribing, clicking that bell telling me I'm stuffed up on Spotify. I appreciate all of that. I appreciate the diverse walks of life who encounter this podcast. And you, listener, are why we are here and why we talk about this music. Thank you. It is all because of you. Just. <laughs>